गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल दार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड वेलकम टू दी वन डे वेबिनार ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ न्यूक्लियर रेडिएशन फॉर सोसाइटल एप्लीकेशन so i request to each and every one please mute you, uh, yourself whenever the speakers are going to present their work so i request to everyone please mute yourself good morning fatih sir good morning good morning thank you very much sir now i will mute my mic yes sir yes sir uh, we are waiting for boraska sir so i request to participants if you are unable to uh, join the zoom meeting app so they can connect via youtube live streaming link also so let us start the webinar of one day national level webinar on the topic of nuclear radiation for societal application i would like to say it's a huge achievement or honor for us to organize such kind of webinar so first of all respected dr bal kamle sir principal dada patil mahavidyalay karjat dist ahmednagar maharashtra india dr m a patil sir convener of the webinar Dr. S. G. Thube, sir, co-convener and vice principal of the Dada Patil Mahavidyalay, Karjat, Mr. Balbim Mahanwar, coordinator of the webinar, and other organizing committee, learn delegates, and from research and academia. A very good morning to one and all. I am Dr. Mahesh Badani, assistant professor and co-coordinator of this webinar. and i feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of department of physics rayat shikshan sanstha dada patil mahavidyalay karjat to the one day national webinar on nuclear radiation for societal application well steven maggi once said replace fear of radiation with curiosity it is on occasion like this we get opportunities to the uh, to test our knowledge and understanding the uh, usefulness about nuclear radiation we look forward to get an exposure about what the best of the brain think about this very dynamic production of nuclear radiation for societal applications i am very happy to say that it's our luck to receive two eminent and well known personalities as a speaker dr boraskar sir and dr fase sir both are very dynamic and pioneering personality in the areas of development of nuclear technology and specially we can say that accelerator system so may i request to vice principal and co convener of this workshop dr s g dubey sir to kindly deliver the welcome address good morning good morning good morning sir yes good morning everyone i am dr ej thube working as a vice principal in raj shikshan sansta dada patil mahavidyalay karta this is located in a amnagar district maharashtra i am very happy to welcome all the participants who are registered in one day national webinar on nuclear radiation for societal applications the total number of participants in this uh, national webinar is approximately at the near 
from various states of India. It is huge achievement for our college for this national webinar. This webinar is organized for one day and there are two invited speakers. I'm very much thankful to Professor Fian Boris Kursar, ex-professor and radiation safety officer of Savitribai Phule Pune University, Pune. Also a visiting professor, South Korea. And Dr. D.M. Fase, director, UGC Department of Atomic Energy Indoor, Madhya Pradesh, accepting our request for giving this lecture. Their knowledge is nuclear physics definitely helps in various students, researchers, and faculties. I'd like to share some information about our samstha and our college. Our parent institute, Raj Sikshan Samstha, was established in 1990 by late Padmasri Dr. Karmavir Bhaurav Pati. The Raj Sikshan Samstha is one of the leading education institute in Asian constituent. Especially Dr. Karmavir Bhaurav Pati focuses on development as well as achievement of the poor and downtrodden classes of our society. In all over Maharashtra and one of the district in Karnataka, nearby 43 senior colleges, 439 high schools, 8 beard colleges, 26 primary schools, and 8 ashrams schools are, and also there are 4 lakh students taking their education and 19,000 teaching and non-teaching staffs are working. It's a huge number in an academic. Let I share some things regarding our college. I can say that Tada Patil Mahavidyalaya Karza is established in 1964, affiliated to Savitribai Phule Pune University, which is one of the best awarded college by the university. This institute aims to build up the character of students through various value-based education and bring about the overall progress of the students. We run 15 courses of UG and 12 courses of PG levels. Recently, we have started PUPOC course, medicinal plant grower from the last year. The institute has hardworking and dedicated faculties. The faculty continuously engaged in teaching, research, and extension activities. At present, 30 faculties are PhD holders and 14 have registered for PhD. The college received DST FIST grant for the development of central instrumentation facility, central computer laboratory, and e-classroom. The institute has well-furnished competitive examination guidance center. Under competitive guidance center, more than 100 students have received job placements within last couple of years. The institute has provided the infrastructure facilities like women hostel, indoor sports facility, indoor shooting range, health center, and well-furnished laboratories. The college has best NCC unit in India. Since last five years, more than 40 cadets attended Republic Day Parade in New Delhi. This is a great achievement of our college. Also, the college has Red Military Academy and in which it is the distinguished activity run by this college. Right now, this activity for current decade, nearly 300 students are selected for police and army placements. Certainly, Dada Patil Mahavidyalaya will achieve the best and global scenario, which we provide and an ideal for others. Therefore, once again, I welcome to everyone, and I would like to say this to the one day national webinar on nuclear radiation for societal applications will definitely 
be achieving their milestone. My best wishes to this national webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful words and best wishes about the one day national webinar. Thank you very much once again for informing the valuable information regarding our Sanstas and our college as well. I now request coordinator of the webinar, Mr. Balbim Mahanwar, to kindly share a few words about the Department of Physics. Please welcome and please share your words about the department, sir. Please. Okay. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, I am Mr. Palpi Manwar, coordinator of this uh, one day national webinar. So, uh, uh, after the establishment of a college in the year 1964, the science team has been evaluated in the year 1984 for first year BSc physics. In a just a couple of years later, in 1990, the college achieved a new milestone by starting a department of physics. And uh, Department of Physics with UG course. In 1990, the TYBSC Physics course just started with seven students, and today it's reached more than 40 students. Hence, it is a big achievement for a college as well as department. The Department of Physics also offering a PG course since 2015 with 24 intake capacity under the guidance of Dr. M. A. Patil, a student. Uh, our uh, student-centric devoted staff produced a 100% success rate of UZ as well as PG courses. The department have highly qualified as well as experienced teaching staff. There are total eight, uh, eight faculties. In that eight faculties, four faculties are PhD holder and remaining four are pursuing PhD. <clears throat> the department provides well-equipped and a specious laboratory with advanced instruments instruments. We are taking departmental space, uh, special subject like uh, uh, physics of nanomaterial, uh, physics of thin film for uh, post-graduation classes. Uh, department have a special computer laboratory with a web searching facility for MATLAB, C programming uh, courses. So department have its own full-fledged department library with more than 200 reference books and more than 100 e-books. So department provides to students different types of research projects on the subject of electronics, energy studies, nanomaterials, thin films, and radiation physics at UZ as well as PG level. The department has several MUs and collaboration, national as well as international institute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Badanis. Uh, thank you, Mahanwar, sir. Your thought-provoking address set a perfect platform for our department and for our speaker to deliver their presentation in the areas of nuclear radiation for societal application. Thank you once again, sir. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I now introduce our first speaker for the day, Professor Dr. V. N. Boraskar, sir. So, Professor V. N. Boraskar, sir, before going to say something about that, during my doctorate journey, if I motivate mostly then the credit goes to respected Boraskar sir and Dhole sir. There are the personality that is my backbone. I'm not too big to introduce those who made me, but I'm lucky that I have got this opportunity to introduce myself to my God. Professor Boraskar sir is not only the personality who is a professor at Savitribai Phule Pune University, but he is also a brand that loves everyone. Dr. Boraskar sir is the first personality who developed the first microton accelerator in India. So I will start from the beginning that Dr. Boraskar sir, after obtaining PhD degree in physics from the University of Pune in 1973. After that, he carried out postdoctoral studies in the University of Western Ontario, Canada and Nagoya University, Japan. In 1975, he joined as a faculty of the Department of Physics, Savitribai Phule Pune University, and actively developed nuclear physics-based laboratories for teaching. In addition, using the university workshop, he developed 
indigenously a number of research facilities such as seven mega electron hold electron accelerator called race track microtron accelerator 14 mb neutron generator 150 kev electron and ion accelerator etc even today these research facilities are unique among the universities of our country using this and other national accelerator facilities he carried out research work in the fields nuclear reaction induced by neutrons protons and bremsstrahlung radiation neutron depth profiling neutron activation analysis in situ synthesis of metal and semiconductor nanoparticles diffusion of elements in polymer at room temperature by electron irradiation radiation damages in semiconductor material and devices induced by electron and swift heavy ions and radiation dosimetry as well similarly he developed a system for simulate simulating radiation environment for space applications employing electrons protons atomic oxygen and uv radiation and a method for the detection and analysis of explosive class materials the elsina 1986 new delhi award was bestowed jointly to pune university with bhel bangalore <laughs> for developing a method based on 6 mev electron irradiation <laughs> as a superior alternative to the gold diffusion processes routinely used by semiconductor industries he had guided more than 24 phd fellows and 30 mphil in physics students and published more than 220 research papers as well in the national and international journals he visited and worked in the universities of japan canada czech republic sweden and south korea during the 2010 to 2021 he was invited four times as a brain pool fellow and professor of physics and worked in sungyeong kwon university suwon south korea he was awarded various awards such as principal vk jog best teacher award of the university of pune for the year 2002 and silver jubilee award ud city university of mumbai in 2001 he is a fellow of institute of physics london united kingdom maharashtra academy of sciences he is the fellow uh, again academy of social sciences allahabad ian bim society, society of india new delhi after working as a faculty of about 32 years he retired on 13th april 2007 as a professor and head department of physics sabitrabai phule pune university pune even after retirement he continued his teaching and research by holding post retirement position of emeritus scientist csir second visiting professor at diit third distinguished professor presently he is an adjunct professor and radiation safety officer sabitribai phule pune university so such a big and great personality he is here so i welcome to respected borester sir to share your valuable lecture in front of our audience so thank you once again So please welcome, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bajane, for nice introduction. So first of all, I would like to thank principal of Dada Patil Mahavidyalay, Kazrat, Ms. Bal Kamble, <clears throat> for inviting me, and all your group members, Dr. Manbar. Badane and to be and all other faculty members of Department of Physics for giving me this chance to deliver this talk in this very important workshop being held in the college. So the topic selected by college I really appreciate. It's a very important and very useful topic the college has selected. <clears throat> so I would like to deliver my talk first by giving introduction. on accelerators and then
Yes, sir. Your screen is visible, sir. Okay. So first, I will talk about the low energy particle accelerators, which reference to our country because all over the world there are hundreds of accelerators. So we cannot cover all those. But what are important that uh, accelerators are there in the country? I shall just brief them, and then some of the important applications of the accelerator. So my talk is focused for the or oriented for the students of BSc and MSc, and not for the expert because I understand that this accelerator is particularly a new subject for the college students, and therefore I try to. be at a lower level of defining the working of accelerators and the applications so if anybody has got any doubt please ask me at the end of the talk uh, because there are 15 minutes are given for the question answer so i'll be very happy to deliver um, after uh, giving uh, after completing my talk of delivering my talk i will definitely answer if there are any questions so now the particle when we say particle accelerators so which are the particles which we have got in mind so as you know that the, we have two types of nuclei one is called uh, stable nuclei in the case of stable nuclei we can handle them as, as we have every day we have aluminum gold silver in your house or our scooter car they are all made of stable element but in addition to stable elements there are many unstable elements either available from nature or made in the laboratory so the definition of the unstable nuclei can be defined in short that that emit radiation any unstable nuclei you take they want to go to stable situation by emitting radiation so the particles which are emitted so i have shown unstable nuclei so they can emit either alpha particle or they can emit uh, minus beta particle they can emit plus beta particle or they can emit gamma rays so the particle energy which is emitted by the unstable nuclei is limited to a few mev or say up to some case it may go to 5 mev or 8 mev maximum but the flux is very small and therefore for the practical applications of radiation we must have our own facility which we call as a accelerator so we have particles which are emitted by the radio nuclei same particle we can accelerate in addition we can also accelerate nuclei of stable elements such as aluminum or gold so so i just written here the particles which are required to be accelerated must have negative or positive charge there is a condition you cannot accelerate neutral particle neutron cannot be accelerated so the condition that if you want to accelerate particle the particle should have a charge so for example electron electrons have a negative charge we call electron and the positive charge electrons we call positron so it should be either electrons or positron or protons they are positive charge they can be accelerated or helium nuclei helium atom is neutral but when you remove electrons from the helium then it has got two electrons when you remove two electrons then that particle we call it the alpha particle and then ions of element suppose we have got a boron or aluminum copper so we can accelerate them we have to make them first ion and after making ion we can accelerate them or elementary particles like pions or like that so i will just define what is the meaning of mev or electron volt energy which is the unit used to define energy of the particle so this is not commonly used in society but there is a scientific term so electron volt is the basic unit of energy so you can see in the diagram that the i have shown one volt battery connected between the two plates so if the electron travels because electron has got a negative charge so it will travel from negative plate to positive plate so when traveling from negative to positive plate the electron has covered a or crossed the potential difference of one electron volt and therefore the energy of the electron 
will be one electron volt. And similarly, if we have got ion, ion will go from positive to negative potential. So right side I have shown that ions are traveling from positive potential to negative potential. And the, suppose the voltage difference between the two plates is 100 volt, then the ion starting from positive plate to negative plate, when it reaches negative plate, its energy will be equal to the potential difference. So I put 100 volt battery, so the ion energy will be 100 electron volt. If I put 1000 volt, it will be a 1000 electron volt. So in the bottom I've shown, if the voltage is 100 volt, the energy will change as per the voltage difference. So 100 volt, 1000 volt, and then, so 1000 volt we call KeV, and six digit we call the million volt. So 1 million volt. So you know that in the house or in the laboratory, it is not possible to create 1 million volt voltage. Some cases, of course, we can some under some condition, we can generate, but it is not very common. So we can have accelerators up to say 400, 500 kV in the laboratory without any problem. But when you go to MEV energy, so we cannot just depend upon this principle, just applying a potential difference between the two plate and accelerate the particle. The technique is not useful. So we have to go for the different techniques. So I will just explain them what are the different techniques. So this is an example of creating an ion, how to create an ion. Suppose I got a lithium element and then I want to create an ion. In that case, my ion will be possible when I remove electron from the lithium. So I have removed an electron from the lithium. So lithium has got six electron. Remove electron, it will have only two electron. So it will be lithium positive ion. So the uh, method of making ionized particle of any element is simply remove electron from the element by some method. Similarly, so the sodium ion I have shown as a positive, when we re remove an electron, it becomes a positive. So in using this technique, we can uh, produce a boron ions or aluminum ions, oxygen ions, fluorine. If when you remove two electrons, then we call it the doubly charged ions. So I have shown manganese, zinc, molybdenum, U, they're all doubly charged ions. So like this, if the number of electrons you remove, the charge state of the element will increase. Similarly, we can also produce a negative charge electron because uh, charge, negative charge ions. Sometimes in accelerators, which I will explain, there are some accelerators in which negative ion is accelerated. So here, you instead of moving electron from the nucleus or from the atom of the element, you add an electron there. So when you add an electron, then it becomes a negative charge ion. So for example, the fluorine, I have shown fluorine atom, I am adding one electron to it. So it becomes, the number of electrons will be more than the proton number. And therefore, it will be a negative ion. So like this, we can produce negative ions. If you put two electrons, it will be two negative two charge ions. So sodium, phosphorus, <coughs> or copper, two negative. <coughs> like this, we can produce the ions. So now there are two types of accelerators because we are now interested to increase the energy of the particle. So one is comes under the category of linear accelerator and other comes under the category of the circular accelerator. So the accelerators can be for electrons or it can be ions. Both linear accelerators, circular accelerators are available for both electrons and ions. So the basic principle I'm just explaining you. So there is a accelerating column where you divide the resistance chains are connected and there are different plates you can see. The extreme left hand plate has got 200 kilovolt potential. Then by resistance chain, we are uh, decreasing the voltage slowly, slowly. At the end, we have got the zero potential. So a positive ion will be repelled by the positive voltage. So the positive ion, if it is produced at the 200 kilovolt position, it will try to go to ground potential. And therefore the ion traveling from a 200 kilovolt potential to ground potential, it will just get accelerated and just know 
the energy of the ion will be equal to 200 keV. Why? Because it has crossed a potential difference of 200 kV. So ion will go from 200 to 0 potential. Now, similarly, if I got a negative ion, because if I just now told you we have got a negative ion also, so then we have a negative 200 kV potential and we inject the negative ion there. Then the negative ion will be repelled by the 200 kV potential and therefore it will get accelerated. It will get accelerated and when it reaches ground potential, when it reaches ground potential, then it will energy will be equal to 200 keV. So we have, if you have a negative potential, then we accelerate the ion from, and if you got a negative ion elements, ions of element, it will travel from negative to ground potential. And if you got a positive ion, it will travel from positive to ground potential. Now, there, now there is a accelerator, which is called electron uh, linear accelerator. So I will just start from a linear accelerator. This is called linear accelerator. So what it shows that, as I told you, just now I shown you the accelerator earlier case, they are DC accelerator. So they are AC accelerator. So what is happening here, the electrons are injected in the tube. So the tube has got a acceleration between the filament and the first tube positive voltage. So electrons are accelerated. But again, the AC voltage, the voltage changes. So inside the tube, the inside the tube, the voltage will be, when the voltage is negative or when it is not favorable, the particle travels inside the tube. And as a result, they don't see the undesirable voltage is not seen by the particle, but they will see only. So whenever the dot goes, the arrows are right hand, so accelerated particles are accelerated. And when the voltage is negative, not favorable, the particles are inside the tube. And when the particles are inside the tube, they do not see any voltage. So this is called a linear accelerator. <coughs> but now the linear accelerator, again, you can see that the tube length increases as the energy increases because the velocity of the particle increases and to keep the particle shielded for a uh, time of the pulse, length increases. And therefore, this kind of accelerators cannot be used for very high energy because you cannot increase the length of the tube and the electrons gain velocity approaches to light when the energy is very high. So this type of accelerators are used for low energy, say under seven uh, MeV or so, not more than one or two MeV. So this is the linear X concept of the linear accelerator. So I will like read again. The electrons are, ions are ejected. No, it presents the electron. So when the ions are injected from their left hand side, <coughs> the potential is negative and the ions are accelerated from positive to negative potential. Because the ions will go to negative potential and not to the positive potential. So alternately, the voltage will change between the gap and the ion will gain energy inside the gap when the potential is negative of the next tube. And the ion travel inside the tube when the voltage is not favorable in the gap for the acceleration. So this is the principle of the linear accelerator. Now below, I have shown the principle of the circular accelerator. Circular accelerator means the particles travel into the circular part. And that's why they are called circular accelerator. So the, in this case, the particle travels in the straight line and the circular path will have accelerators of the circular accelerators. Now, this is again the same picture which I have shown you, linear accelerator. So this you can use for the electron because the voltage is now positive to the drift tube. So the blue color is the electron. So earlier we have seen the ion, this is for the electron. So you can see the tube is positive and the electrons are just in the gap. So negative positive electron has got negative charge. So it will get accelerated. <coughs> Again, when it is not favorable, the electron will be inside the tube. So it will be shielded. Again, it comes to the gap. 
So like this, the particles are accelerated in, in between the gap of the tube and they gain energy. So like this, the, this is the principle of the linear accelerator. Now, as I told you that we cannot have a very long tube continuously because the energy increases or shielding, you have to provide the tube. So the tubes will be very, very long. So instead of that, micro technique is used for accelerating the electrons and ions. RF power is used for the ions and uh, micro technique is used for the electrons. So in this case, the cavities are produced and you can see that when the positive voltage is there, because the, these are called traveling wave, uh, so waves travel along with the electron. And whenever electron gains a, gets a positive voltage uh, in the iris or in the cavity, they get energy. So electrons are accelerated in the bunches. So top one you can see, and bottom one is called standing wave pattern, and the top one is the traveling wave pattern. So in this case, the particles travel along with the wave and continuously gain energy. In the case of standing wave, there's a wave is reflected and the standing wave pattern is there. And again, the particles get accelerated due to the uh, positive. Uh, it depends if the ions are there, they will get accelerated negative due to negative voltage. As I have shown below, the arrow shows the particle accelerated and the voltage is negative. So it is favorable for the ion. <clears throat> so both uh, dotted line and complete line, you can see whenever there is a negative voltage, the ions get accelerated. So this is the principle of the linear accelerator. So in India, <coughs> there is an organization called Samir. They are making a linear accelerator and the CAT also, they also make a linear accelerator. So these linear accelerators can provide both beams of ions as well as electrons. So this is the Samir is, uh, has got a, on their system to produce electron accelerator. And this electron accelerator, as I shown you below, the electrons are accelerated in the cavity this is the accelerator and so these accelerators are used for the medical application. So this is the now the other type of other type of accelerator which uh, you have must have studied is the Vendigraph generator. So I will not spend time much on this, but this is a accelerator which can provide uh, particle energy up to 5 MV very easily <clears throat> or even up to 15 MV yeah, accelerators are available from this. So in the, here in this case, what happens, there is a pulley, top pulley and bottom pulley and there is a rubber belt on it. And the uh, on the uh, ground level, the charge is uh, spread on the belt and the belt moves. As the belt moves, the charge also because the rubber is the insulator, so charge moves along with the insulator and the dome picks up the charge and becomes positive charge. And the belt comes back with the negative charge. Again, it gets positive charge. And in this way, the dome gains positive voltage continuously and the voltage because of Q is equal to CV. So the charges of the voltage dome increases. And then <coughs> we can have an ion source because if the voltage of the dome is positive, then we can put an ion source there and the ions will go from positive voltage to ground potential and ion will get accelerated. So for ion charge one, the ion energy is equal to dome voltage because the electron, if the voltage is 400 kilovolt, for example, then ion energy will be uh, 4 uh, keV. If the dome is having 5 million volt, then the ion energy will be 5 electron volt. So depending upon the ion, uh, this the dome voltage, the ion energy will be according to the voltage of the dome. And the belt continuously moves and continuously charge is spread on the dome. And as a result, the voltage is there and the ions being positive charged, they will go from dome to ground and they get accelerated and the energy and the beam is used for the exercise. So this kind of technique is used for the peritron. <coughs> because again, the limit of this acceleration is uh, maybe 5 uh, MeV or so because the rubber cannot withstand the high voltage because you can see the rubber belt is connected between the ground and the high voltage dome. And as a result, the, there is a leakage of current. So this kind of system can be used only for the 5 MeV uh, in our 5 MeV volt. So now the another technique is used, which is called peletron. So the Vendigraph charge belt 
as I uh, told you, okay, not so instead of uh, belt, rubber belt, they use pellets of steel and the pellets are connected by the nylon. <coughs> so there is a chain. So because of the pellets are used, so pellets, there are pellets and then you can see the pellets here. The pellets are there and in between they are connected by the nylon link. So they are insulated. So the charge is spread on the here belt. So the belt is made of the ring of the pellets, pellets, pellets. And the charge is given here. So principle is same. Only advantage here is that because of the pellets and nylon in between, the charge voltage can be there up to 15 million volt. In the case of uh, rubber, only 10 million, 5 million volt is possible. In this case, we can go up to 15 million volt. And that's why the particles nowadays, the accelerators or pellets are used for acceleration of the particle instead of ventigraph. But the basic principle is the ventigraph. Only rubber belt is replaced by the pellets here. And then they are using this uh, technique for increasing the voltage of the dome. So now, this is an accelerator which is called pelletron. So this is the same technique which uh, I explained to you. In this case, <coughs> the dome is between. Now here, the high voltage dome is shown here. Or here I have shown the high voltage dome here. So same dome, same accelerating technique is there. But now the dome has come in the center here. And now there is one accelerating column on the top. And accelerating column on the down here. Now, here what is done? This dome is charged with the positive. So, belt is here. In this case, the belt is connected and the dome is charged, positive voltage. And now, this accelerating column and here the ion source is of negative charge. Just now I told you, then we can produce negative charge ions also. So, here we have a negative charge ion source. So, ions are injected. So, the, this whole system is a negative voltage. <coughs> and this is positive voltage. So the ions will travel from ground to, because they are all negative charge particles. So negative charge particle will go from negative to positive. And therefore, the negative ions, if it is a positive ions, it will not travel. But since they are negative ions, so negative ions will travel, because they are ground potential here. From ground to positive voltage, it will travel. And therefore, the ion energy will be equal to potential difference here. So here, I have written here, if the V10, if the voltage is 10 million volt, the ion energy will be 10 AV. So after that, the ions are passed through a stripper. So the ions, first negative ions will be passed through the accelerating column, and then they will come to column. In the column, the because now the negative ion cannot travel further because there's a positive voltage in the ground. So what is done, the electrons of the ions are removed. So now it, it changes to positive voltage, positive ion. And then when it becomes a positive ion, then like a Vendigraph generator, the positive ion will travel from here to ground. So the technique is used. First, we got negative ion here. Then convert negative ion to positive ion. The positive ion again will travel here. So two times we get acceleration. Acceleration here and acceleration here. So this is the technique called Vendigraph generator. So here the same thing I've shown here, that the negative ions are traveling from here. Then here there is a stripper. They strip, uh, they remove the charge of the uh, electrons are removed, it becomes positive charge, and the positive charge will come here. And here, the ions are negative, they are, uh, the electrons are removed here by technique called stripper. Then the positive ions travel and then they come here and then they are built. So, double the voltage, the, uh, we are getting the advantage here. <coughs> I shown here the technique of stripper. Here, there is a carbon foil is normally used. So you can see the aluminum ions are coming because they are accelerated with negative ion. When they go from a carbon foil, they lose their electron and they are converted into positive ions. Now, when they become positive charge, so we don't know how many electrons are removed. Sometimes one electron is removed, sometimes two electrons are removed, sometimes three electrons are removed. And therefore, the ions will have a different charge state. Some ions will have two charge state. Some ions will have one charge state. Some ions will have four and so on. And therefore, <coughs> similarly, instead of uh, this uh, carbon foil, gas also is used, gas stripper. So you can see here, 
carbon negative, carbon 13, CH negative, when they pass, they become positive charge. So this is called the stripping technique. Now here, very interesting point to be noted, because just now I told you that the, the positive charge here of the ion is getting accelerated, because now he has just now showed you, from here to here, the positive ion is accelerated. So here now the charge state is different. Here the only single charge state. Here the charge state is different. And therefore, <clears throat> for example, if the charge state is 4, so the ion energy is equal to Ev into NeV. So the charge state is 4 initially and the voltage, the terminal voltage is 12 million volt, for example. So initially, it will gain energy at 12 million volt. And after uh, becoming positive, the charge state is 4. So because the energy is equal to NeV. Charge it. So you are getting 60 MeV energy of the particle. So by using only 12 million volt terminal, you are getting 60 million volt. So this is the way pelotrons are used and they are very commonly used in the country. So we got two pelotrons in the country. So the original, if you go to laboratory, you will see this kind of pelotron in the laboratory. So in India, we have shown you they are the vertical shape. So negative ions are put. So negative ions will come here. There is a charge uh, change stripper. Negative ions will become positive ion, and the positive ion will get accelerated and will go. So this is the way. So we got two accelerators in the country. One is 15 million volt terminal voltage at I International Accelerator Center, New Delhi, and one is at TIFR. Uh, one is at TIFR. It has got 14 million volt. So if you go to TIFR, you can see a big tower. Because the accelerator, as I shown you here, the accelerator needs a long uh, height of the tower because first part is uh, negative uh, for negative ion, second part is for positive ion, and in between we got a stripper. So these two accelerators are used, and this IUC accelerator is meant for the uh, university and uh, college teacher. So any college teacher interested in research, they can uh, communicate with the scientist of the IUC. On website, uh, they've got address, and you can also write a proposal, and they give you funding also. If uh, you you make a, you have to go and discuss with some scientists there. You make a proposal, so they will give you one research students, and they will give you contingency, and they also give you travel. They also when you go to Delhi, they will also arrange for your accommodation. So they very nice facility, and meant only for the university teachers and the student. So I request all of you to visit IUC, you can contact the person there. And other facilities in Mumbai, TIFR. So if you visit Mumbai TIFR, but this is a DAE facility mostly used by the Department of Energy Scientists. But anyway, one can also use this because we have used this facility also being in the university. Now we come to circular accelerator. So in circular accelerator, now so far we have seen that the particles travel in the straight line. So we call them as a linear accelerator. <clears throat> now, the particles gain energy in the case of circular accelerator, particles travel in the circular path and they travel gain energy either at the point of crossing to accelerating plate or in the microwave. So there are this type of accelerators, one is called cyclotron and other accelerators for ions, electrons, they are called synchrotron, then the microtron and rest time microtron. So in our Pune city, we have built one rest time microtron as Dr. Badana has already told you. So I just briefly explain what is rest tech microtron, what is microtron, and cyclotron. Cyclotron, of course, you must have studied. <clears throat> now, there are two types of cyclotron. In ordinary cyclotron, the... <clears throat> he saw it, it is not 12 mega, it is 1.2 Tesla. I have that. Hmm. 1.2 Tesla here. So... So due to low magnetic field, this is one, not 12 Tesla, please read it 1.2 Tesla. <coughs> cyclotrons are normal use for cyclotrons are normal use for exciting hydrogen and helium ions. So please read this as 1.2 Tesla, not uh, 12 Tesla. Sorry, but there is a mistake. And therefore, the low field, only hydrogen and helium ions are accelerated in the cyclotron. But nowadays, there is a technique of increasing the magnetic field. 
and the technique is used superconducting cyclotron. <coughs> In the case of superconducting cyclotron, therefore the ions can be accelerated heavy ions because the magnetic field is very large. So you can accelerate the ions also. So the basic principle of the cyclotron is you is there are two Ds and the ions are produced in the D and the ions are injected in the D. Due to magnetic field, the ions will travel a circular path. Again, it comes to D, again it gains energy. So the energy is more, so it will travel a large radius path. Again, it will get energy in the Ds, again energy increases. So you can see that at each time when it crosses the D, it gains energy and as the energy is more and the magnetic field is constant, the particle uh, start traveling larger, larger, and finally the particles are excited, uh, are removed from the uh, or exit from the excel. So you have just shown here. You can see the north pole and south pole of the mag magnet, and the particles are accelerated in the D. So there are two uh, Ds are there, and they are given RF voltage. Alternative voltage are there. When voltage is not favorable, the particles remain in the D. So this this type of accelerator is called cyclotron. And in India, we have got a cyclotron in uh, BRC center is there, which is called VCC. There the center is there, there the cyclotrons are there. So VCC Calcutta center has following three cyclotrons. One is called K130 cyclotron for low mass ions such as hydrogen helium ion. Then K500 is called superconductive cyclotron for ions of heavy elements. And other is called K30 medical cyclotron is produced radio sort of required for the medical application. So this center is very rich in cyclotron. And all the three cyclotrons are uh, maintained by the uh, staff there. So this cyclotron, three cyclotron, I will just briefly only give you idea. So this is the medical cyclotron. This gives you 30 MV protons. And this is mostly used for making the radio isotopes of the, for the medical application. Other cyclotron, so the proton beam of 30 up to 20 MV, so it is called 30 MV uh, cyclotron. The energy normally used is 20 MV. The current is very large, 20, 200. And the radio isotopes are produced using nuclear reaction. Different nuclear reactions are there for producing radio isotopes. So these radio isotopes are used. For example, zinc 68 bombarded by proton, it can, gets converted into gallium. And similarly, iodine and uh, in indium, fluorine, there are many articles or particles uh, can be, protons can be used to convert or use to make radio isotopes. So these radio isotopes are extensively used for the medical application. So this is a very old cyclotron with a low magnetic field. And therefore, the magnetic field is low, so only protons and helium ions are used uh, for this accelerator. So the specification like alpha particles, 30 to 65 MV can be accelerated in this accelerator and proton from 70.5 to 18. And the current is 25 microampere. So there are the specifications. So if you are interested to use cyclotron, you can use it because this is also available for the public. use. Yeah. So this is a view of the superconducting cyclotron because as I told you, the superconducting cyclotron is there. So it can accelerate ions up to 20, 80 MeV per nucleon. So very high energy. <coughs> Proton up to 80 MeV. Helium ions up to 60 MeV. So 80 MeV per nucleon means the A number is the number of nucleon. So for example, helium. Helium has got four nucleons. Two protons and two neutrons. So 8 into 4, 320 MeV alpha particles you can get. So like this, you can have a higher mass also, lithium, copper, any element you can say. So that will be 10 MV per A. So you can calculate the energy. So if you, if you visit Calcutta, <coughs> do visit the superconducting cyclotron. So three cyclotrons you can see there. So this is the center where the Calcutta center is located. No other uh, cyclic accelerator is called microtron, which is also very extensively used. So microtron is an electron cyclotron, uh, electron accelerator. And there are two types of microtron. One is called classical or classical microtron, cyclic or classical microtron. The other is called restrict microtron. So this class, classical microtron can go up to 40 MeV energy 
because the uh, orbits are limited there. But the racetrack microtron can go up to 500 AMV. So there are two types of microtron. So the electrons are accelerated in the oscillating electric field by the uh, produced in the cavity. So this is a conventional microtron. <coughs> so in this microtron, there is a magnetic field. You can see the cavities here. So electrons are injected. So electron will travel a circular path. And again, it will come energy increases. So it will have a larger radius. Again, it comes inside again. So the electron will have a circular path. And finally, electrons are accepted. So this is called conventional. And so this is a very old technology for developing microtron. So in a small space, because linear accelerator, you've got a very long space, long, 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 you have to travel the electron. In circular accelerator, electron has to travel only circular path. So in a small area, you can increase the large energy of the electron you can get. So this is a very popular accelerator, this is called microtron. So accelerating cavity is here. So yeah, electron is rotate here, comes here, again gain energy in the microwave, again comes back, again energy gain. And as the energy increases, magnetic field is constant, so radius is more. And accordingly, the electron goes out. So in indoor cat, this accelerator is available. And the cat has also given one accelerator <coughs> to Mangalore University. So there is also one uh, conventional microtron made by cat indoor. It, one is at indoor and one is in Mangalore University. So this 6 to 12 AV University of Mangalore and the 22 MeV as RR cat indoor. The two uh, microtrons of the conventional type. But there is another type of accelerator uh, microtron which is called race tag microtron. So in the case of conventional microtron, the cavity is located between the two poles and the magnet is there for large gap and limits the electron energy because the magnetic field cannot be increased. Whole cavity is kept in the magnetic field. So the design of rest microtron overcomes this limitation. So in the rest microtron, the magnet is splitted and the accelerating cavity is kept in the field-free region. So like this is the microtron of the Pune city, which we built long back. So you can see that the magnets are splitted and the cavity is kept in the field free region. And therefore, the magnetic field between the gap is, can be very large because the gap, magnet gap is very small, only one 10 millimeter. Whereas in the case of CAD, the gap is very large because the cavity is kept in the magnet. In our case, the cavity is not kept in the magnet, but in the kept in the field free region. And we've got a four mag magnet here, one, two, three, and four. So electrons are injected in the cavity, electrons comes out, they will travel one path, again comes inside the cavity, again gain energy, they will have a second orbit, again comes inside, they will have a third orbit, fourth orbit, fifth orbit, like that, and they come in the ring. So this is a six orbit, so we have got a six AV energy. If you increase the orbit, number of orbits, you can increase the energy up to eight AV. So this accelerator was built by me long back in 19... Uh, uh, 75 to 80, and it was operational in 1980. <clears throat> so, Raja Rambanna, who was uh, chairman of DAE, inaugurated his accelerator when he started giving the beam out. So, this is the view of the microtron of the Pune City. This is the experimental facility. So, the beam, electron beam comes out. This is the electron comes out. This is the bending magnet and this is the experimental area. These are the quadrupole lenses. So one can do the experiments here, or also one can do the experiments here also. So it's all homemade system. As uh, Dr. Banana has uh, told you, all these experimental systems were made in the university workshop. Because in those days, the funding was not much and uh, imported things were very expensive. So the trend in the country was to make our own instrument. So not all, there were few institutes in the country where Pune University is one of the top universities where all the facilities were made by using workshop facilities. This is the control panel of the microtron. We control because we cannot go near the microtron when the microtron is on. So the control panel is kept in the other room. So here we use the control. So the rest of microtron. So these are the specifics of the rest of microtron. We can go up to 8 AV energy, 0 0.5 to 1 AV. There it can be operated to two modes, up to 1 AV and 6 to 1 AV. So we got different applications of the microtron. We use it for the semiconductor 
radiation damage semiconductor, diffusion of metal, production of uh, pulse neutron beam. There are many applications for hydrogen pulse, uh, Bremson radiation, synthesis of nanoparticles. We also made nanoparticles by electrons. So there are many applications of the, and the number of students have obtained PA degree using this microtron, the radiation dosimetry. <clears throat> this is again, uh, my, as a continuation, I am just showing you. Then another accelerator which we build is called neutron generator. So this is based on the deuterium reaction, deuterium tritium reaction. So the deuterium ions of 150 kV are bombarded on the tritium target or tertiary, and neutrons are produced, and neutron flux is there. So at present, the our institute is the only institute in the country where neutron generator is working, and so only everything is homebound. So this is the nuclear reaction. We bombard uh, H2 means deuterium and H3 means tritium. So we bombard deuterium on the tritium and the Q value is 17.6 MV. So helium ions produced, they get energy 3.6 and neutron gets 14 MV energy. So the natural reaction. And that's why it is called 14 MV neutron generator. And we can get flux of 20 power 8. So this is a view of the neutron generator. The 100% made in our laboratory, high voltage unit also was made. This is a cockroach voltage generator. <clears throat> so everything you can see, they are made in the laboratory. The control panel of the neutron generator. This is the gamma ray because when we use the gamma ray technique, we produce new, uh, new radioisotopes by bombarding neutrons on a sample, and the gamma ray spectrum we record here. So there are different applications we have. The measurement of cross section and the explosion analysis. We have got the Ministry of Defense project where we have developed technique for analysis of explosive class material. Then we also analyze archaeological samples, coins, biological plants. So different applications are there. And we are a number of students have obtained PhD degree on using this neutron generator. Now we'll come to single rotation source, is also a cyclic accelerator. So there is a center called Raja Ramanna. Center uh, for Advanced Technology. This is what it's called RR CAT. So RR CAT means Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology. It is situated in Indore, Madhya Pradesh. So there are two accelerators. One is called Indus One, and other is called Indus Two. If you go to Indore, you can visit. This is the Government of India facilities. We need a facility in the country. So one accelerator is called Indus One. <clears throat> so Dr. Fasi, after me, Dr. Fasi is going to talk to you. So he will explain you all the work. But I'm just telling in reference to cyclic accelerator in the country. So this is also a cyclic accelerator because the, the this is a microtron, as I told you. So this microtron, this microtron uh, gives 22 electron volt, uh, 20 MeV, 22 MeV beam, electron beam. Then there's a booster here, increase the energy, <coughs> it is put in the ring. So the electron continue to move here and here the energy is given to the electron. So the advantage here is that the electron can be kept in the ring for a very long time. And why the rings is used? Because uh, the electron has got a property that wherever it bends, it is straight line. If when it bends in the magnet, it will emit radiation. So the radiation which are uh, given by electron are used here. So these accelerators are called synchrotron radiation source because synchrotron radiation are used here. So they are not, the particles are not used here, but the radiation coming out of uh, single radiation there. So, other, so this is the way. So you can see that whenever there is a bend of the electron, so the electrons are there. So you get UV radiation, you get infrared radiation, you get soft X-rays. So 100, the energy is 450 MeV. So there are, uh, the, whenever there's a bend, magnet is there, so electrons bend, you get uh, beam coming out of, the tube and the tubes are used for the so advantage here is that the intensity is very really large <clears throat> even more than the laser light and the laser light is available only for only few frequencies few wavelength of light here you get continuous light you get uh, ir you get visible you can get x-ray and therefore this uh, radiations are very useful so you can select the radiation which you are interested this is the indus 2 which is which can go up to 2.5 gv and again, a circular accelerator. And again, the beam lines are there for the accelerator. This is the beam line for the industry. 
So whenever there is the electron bends in the magnet, the radiations are emitted. So this gives a very hard X-rays, UV radiation. So this is also a beautiful facility, it's very useful. So this is called synchrotron radiation. So because radiations which are emitted, they are called synchrotron radiation. So they are the view of the accelerator inside it. So this gives X-ray, UV radiation, I radiation. <clears throat> now I will just brief, in addition to these accelerators which I explained to you, there are many other accelerators in the country which were made in the institute or purchased here. So I'll just give a brief review so you will know which are the accelerators available in the country. So here, most of the accelerators in the country within, they are made by atomic energy institutions. A few accelerators were developed in universities. And Samir is a government of institute developed linear accelerator for metal detection. So this is the institute in the country. This is in Bombay. So this is uh, located on the IIT campus, Mumbai. So they are making linear accelerators for the medical application. So this brief uh, summary. So SP Pune University, we got Restack Microtron. Then there is also one linear accelerator on the Pune University campus, which is not much known, 6 MV accelerator, which is used by the chemistry scientists. <clears throat> then there is one accelerator which I told you, conventional microtron in the Mangalore University. It uh, energy can be varied from 8 to 12 MV. But this uh, Mangalore University microtron is maintained by the DA scientists of Indo, because they were made and given to them. Then other university, uh, University of Punjab, they got a small cyclotron up to 6 MV proton and heavy and 12 uh, MV. Then IIT Kanpur, there is a Vendigraph generator of 2 MV. IPR Gandhinagar, they got 200 kV gaseous ion accelerator. The University of Pune also, we got a 160 ion accelerator. The University of Mumbai also got a 130 kV ion planter. Then IIT Delhi, then Andhra University, BHU, Muslim University. The right hand side uh, accelerators were there long back, but now they are not in operation because the maintenance of the accelerator is very difficult. And those who have worked in the new generation, because we have to spend a lot of time and with the money is not available for funding, then it will be very difficult to maintain the accelerator. And so there in India, there are many accelerators were there, but now they are non-operational because the manpower is not available and funds are not available. But luckily in Pune City, our accelerators are working for the last 40 years without any problem. Luckily, we are getting good funding from the uh, different agencies as well as support from Pune University. And we've got a very devoted faculty at present. And Dr. Dhole, who is a professor, now looking after the neutron generator and microtron facility in the mean my absence. So there are different additional sources, as I told you, kind of some here. And these are the accelerators which I have told you just now. They are the, so I did not tell you about the Institute of, Institute of Physics Bhuneshwar. There is again a government of India Institute. They have got the 3 MV Paratron. Then there is the IGCAR Kalpakam. IGCAR means Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. It is in Kalpakam near Ch Chennai. They also got 1.7 MV tandem accelerator the kind of Paratron. Then Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics has got a 400 kV. Then TIF has got 14 MV Pelotron. So, and BRC has got a folded tandem accelerator of 6 million volt terminal. So, these are the brief summary of the accelerators in the country. Now, we'll go for the applications of low energy particle accelerator. So, here, <coughs> I, have, I'm, I have tried to cover some application are not all the application which are useful for the society because the our today's theme of the workshop is societal application of the nuclear radiation so i just picked up some application and which are useful for the society <clears throat> so i'll just grow fast because time is not much available but uh, i will try to consider only which are really useful uh, techniques First, I'll go for the industrial application of the accelerators and the radioisotopes. So, first, the gamma radiography. So, gamma radiography is extensively used in the industries for looking at the defects. 
even the aeroplanes which are made or your scooter uh, chassis or scooter piston car uh, everything is so the, what is the principle of the gamma radiography the intensity of gamma rays that noted by high z element such as fe pb w is greater than by that by the low z element such as aluminum silicon or air so the attenuation of the gamma rays or x ray is more by the high z element and low for the low z element that is the basic principle now you go to doctor for x ray so this is just an example suppose i got a this is a steel plate i have shown here this steel plate then the steel plate has got a small crack in between in the in the center but if you see the steel plate from the outside you cannot make out whether it is a hole or not but when you take a x ray then you can see some defects in the x ray field same thing as you see our defects in your bone or like that so you can see that defect which is in the steel plate you can see either by on the x ray so there will be some spot will be there so one can make out so this kind of industrial uh, plates uh, in the which are used in the aeroplane or which are used in car so all the plates are examined by x ray or gamma ray technique so why the spot is here because the here the penetration of the uh, x rays or gamma rays are very less but here because there is a crack here the attenuation is less and therefore the x rays or gamma rays coming here will be more and i'm making a spot here this is the basic technique how we detect the gamma ray uh, defects by gamma ray so this is technique so this technique is used there is the same thing i have shown here again so there is a for sample there is a steel sample but there is a crack inside so outside you cannot make the crack but when you bombard the x rays on this and if you put a photographic plate here then you can see a crack on the photograph so this is a beautiful technique to see the cracks in the steel plate which are not visible for the power out now in the uh, say industries if you go to say kirloskar or tata company in pune or other industries they have a radiography facility routinely used so what they do they either use accelerator electron accelerator or x ray generator or unit and they put inside the suppose there is a casting of some metal so they want to see there is a crack so they will put the source inside the casting and outside they will put a photograph plate so suppose this casting has a crack here so immediately the photo because the gamma ray x ray will penetrate more from the crack side as compared to non crack good uh, layer and therefore you will have uh, some defects seen on the plate and as a result you can make out that there is a crack here so this is a routinely used technique used by the industries automobile industries on oil tanker many industries are using this technique similarly big uh, pipe lines which are used in our say drainage or oil they are also tested for the uh, gamma ray by so you can see a person testing so they are the steel chap, uh, say pipes so company study going there is a defect so they will put the Uh, source here detector here the source outside and uh, by uh, moving the motor inside they will check whether there is a defect in the system so all these steel plates pipes which we see used for the drainage or for oil purpose any purpose they are first tested by the x-ray radiography <coughs> you can see the truck the machine is there so it will just move inside the uh, pipe and record the So the person can go anywhere. They can take it and record the X-ray by using the X-ray technique. They can see defects in the pipe. Now another technique used for the truck. Now if you take a X-ray, a big a gamma ray machine, because linear accelerators are there, when you bombard electrons on some thin material, brainstorm relations are coming, and you can see there is a photograph of a, a truck. So you can see what is inside the truck. You can find out. and the truck inside the truck photo you can see from so there are in foreign country there are very big x ray machine in uh, airport also you must have seen the x ray machine but they are small x ray machine to take the x ray of a truck you need a very large machine so there these are the technique used on airport big uh, system uh, 
for shipyard to take the photographs of what is inside the container because you cannot see. But of course, the gamma ray has got a limitation. So you cannot have a lot, but some idea you can definitely get what is inside. Instead of gamma ray, nowadays neutron radiography is used. Now the advantage of neutron radiography is that you can see that the first I've seen the neutron and X-ray are opposite. As I told you here, the X-rays are attributed by the hazard element and uh, those element pass the X-rays. And therefore, the tire and everything you can see, the tire, the truck tire, the X-rays have passed very easily. This is so X-ray can pass through the loser element, but they are attributed by the hydrogen element. The neutron can pass through hydrogen element. Suppose there is a neutron here, the neutron can pass through hydrogen element. So there will be attenuation, but not much. But for the water or loser element, neutron and sensitivity go down immediately. So neutrons are attenuated by the loser element, whereas gamma ray and X-rays are attenuated by the hydrogen element. So they're different. So we use both gamma ray technique as well as neutron technique, neutron radiography. So neutron radiography is used for detecting loser elements. So to hazard element, no, for example, here there's a hand block, and uh, there is a say there is a hole, and we have put it here, say wax we put here. So what will happen? Neutrons will penetrate through iron without any problem. But the wax being a loser element, it will absorb the neutron and you will get the a spectrum or some indication of the display because neutrons have not reached the here because they are absorbed by the by the loser element, say paraffin or water. And therefore, the neutron radiography is used to detect loser element in the hydrogen element. Now, for example, if there's a neutron source, if I put a flower here, then I will get a uh, picture of flower because uh, flower contains water and the water absorbs neutron. And so I will get a picture of the water. So neutron radiography is used for the loser element. So for example, here, just a simple example, there is a steel pipe here. So if I take X-ray, I'll get this kind of X-ray here. If I get gamma ray, because higher energy gamma ray, I'll get this thing. But if I get neutron radiography, I can see the bottom one is neutron radiography. So I can see something is kept in the pipe. If this pipe is here, you cannot make out what is kept in the pipe because the X-ray cannot penetrate the ion. And they will so gamma rays will penetrate, but even then they will be not able to tell you. It's a little bit we can see. But in the radiography, neutron radiography, <coughs> what happens? The <coughs> neutrons are able to penetrate the iron because the iron they can penetrate but if the material kept inside is containing loaded element then the neuron will be absorbed there and therefore you can see what is kept inside the tube for example here you can see some material is kept in the pipe which you cannot see by radiography or gamma radiography you can see neutron radiography because neutrons will penetrate the steel pipe, but neutrons cannot penetrate the loser element. So, both the, the, the multimeter is of a kept is having a case of plastic. Plastic will absorb neutron or some filling material there or some explosive material. So, explosive material also, uh, explosive material also contains loser element. So, they will also absorb neutron. <coughs> so, the neutrons are absorbed by loser element. <coughs> so, the photography can be seen very easily. So neutron radiography is used for detecting loader element and explosive class material is also comes under cable no, lizard. Suppose there's a lizard in the pipe. <clears throat> if I take a neutron radiography, I can see the lizard because lizard contains a lot of water and loader element. So I can immediately find a lizard inside a pipe, which we cannot see by X-ray or uh, gamma ray. Now here is a warhead kept inside the truck. The neutron radiography can be is able to record the warhead. The outside the truck, nothing will be visible. But neutron radiography is able to detect the warhead kept inside the uh, tank of the truck. Because the neutron will be absorbed by the warhead. Warhead contains explosive. And explosive material contains loaded element like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen. And they will absorb neutron. If they absorb neutron, the radiography will tell you 
what is kept inside the so this is a very useful technique neutron radiography for detecting low third elements and now being used at various places now there is a photo of a car a car is kept inside the truck load and outside you cannot see but if you take a photograph because the car contains lot of rubber and paint oil paint so this car shape photograph is due to paint and oil paint and rubber plastic so this one can see the photograph of a car kept inside a tank metal tank which is not visible to you from outside not visible to x ray radiography or gamma radiography so this neutron radiography is very useful technique and being used at the shipyard or big airports not in our country is not at come but in usa germany japan their country they are using this technique routinely <clears throat> to check the containers now i'll come to the medical application but i'll go fast now because time will not be there so different types of radioisotopes are used for medical application sodium 24 technetium iodine phosphorus so the sodium uh 24 because we get sodium 23 is the stable sodium 24 is the radioactive material so if the sodium 24 is injected in the body then the our blood our blood vessels doctor can because sodium 24 is a radioactive material and if whether the blood is flowing or not properly it can be detected by the radiation monitor so because sodium 23 is a stable sodium 24 is the radioactive so our body which will mix with the blood and whether blood flow is proper or not in the body doctor can measure because the sodium 24 emits radiation and radiation will come out from your leg or anywhere and whether blood is there or not doctor can make out for making the radiation so this is very useful technique other is thyroid <coughs> now, thyroid gland uh, we know that is a big problem for many people and doctor again treat the thyroid by using the radioisotope so here i have the radioisotope isotope 123 is a stable isotope by mistake i have written radioisotope i which is only isotope so isotope 123 is a stable isotope iodine whereas 131 is the radioisotope which emits gamma ray so the body does not understand whether it is a stable iodine stable because we eat salt you must have uh, seen the advertisement i advertise the salt use salt with iodine so we eat iodine every day and the iodine is absorbed by the thyroid but our body mechanism is such that the iodine is absorbed by the thyroid gland but if we instead of iodine 127 if you put radioactive iodine 123 the thyroid will not understand whether it is radioactive or stable it will absorb and the reason the thyroid absorbs radioactive and the doctor give you injection of iodine 131 and it selectively absorbed by the thyroid and the doctor goes and see the patient by radiography and this is a, if the thyroid doctor can make out whether the thyroid has any problem or not so it is a technique for the radiography of the thyroid as well as for treatment so this emits uh, gamma ray x ray gamma ray and gamma ray treat the thyroid also so it is a very useful technique for this then this is a samir uh, electron accelerator this extensively used for the treatment of a patient having cancer where electron beam is injected on the human body only at the place of tumor and the tumor uh, is treated where cancer cells are killed by the electron beam so this is a routine technique used in pune also in uh, mumbai there are many hospitals where with these facilities are available and samir is contributing in making this Uh, excellent we also have a project with the samir in making this type of system now i just go for agricultural application shortly again but time is not much in the field of agriculture radiation technology is contributing for the development of high yield crops because the high yield is required then also preservation of the crop preservation of insect infection so different types of applications are there so the health and safety authority of our over 40 countries have approved radiation processing of over 30 different food items so you can process a food item is permitted by the industry committee so food or seeds are irradiated by the radiation there is a electron accelerator which will produce gamma ray you can irradiate the food so 
the genetic modification is known as the mutation and nuclear technology is is important means or in modifying the properties of the seeds so seed properties are modified by gamma ray radiation and so we can see that the different types of pulses are being produced <coughs> so now improved say groundnut <coughs> peas or black grain <coughs> so in india <coughs> we got many uh, the brc is the main center and they are helping to improve the breed you no know, bananas the tissue culture also in banana so you got large growth of the banana so by using radiation they have mutation and they have, so tissue culture pineapple so almost all the fruits which we eat nowadays maybe they are modified by the, the food items are of the red also by gamma ray you no know, for example banana the shelf life of banana is very small but if we radiate banana with the gamma ray the shelf life can be increased to month also so when we import uh, fu- fruits from america or other they are all gamma radiated the shelf life is increased now you can see onion left side onion they will not be sprouting because they are radiated with the gamma ray right hand side the onions they are not radiated so will have sprouting so you can inhibit the sprouting in a uh, potato also same thing then processed and processed thermic and so there are Uh, the the suji also right hand side unprocessed left hand side processed so nowadays this gamma radiation technique is used for preservation of the food and so the market nowadays when you purchase uh, spices or like that there they say they are all irritated with the well, not oil but many of them are irritated with the gamma ray for the food preservation and our government has uh, permitted onion rice dried mango for irradiation so the government permission is given to some uh, parties for uses so when you purchase a food which is irradiated this kind of symbol you can see on the packet so all the processed food the government has insisted that if the food is irradiated with the radiation you should put this mark so you can see this mark on the food packet now radioisotopes are also used for sterilization nowadays you can see earlier we used to sterilize say scissor or all medical equipment they were boiled in the water but nowadays they are all uh, irradiated with the gamma ray and they are they are processed also radioisotopes also they are giving to hospital so in brc bombay there is a big center which produce radioisotope for the medical application and also preserve gamma rays so this is a center in uh, washi navy where gamma rays are used for the preservation of the uh, medical application so this is the gamma ray chamber where you can put the uh, say cotton or scissor or medical appliances you can see even if you purchase a cotton from medical store there will be small nodes sterilized by gamma ray or if you uh, press all medical appliances nowadays they are sterilized by irradiating the gamma ray so this is a very big technique and very commonly used in the country so you can see the gamma rays uh, they so boxes are irradiated for medical uh, equipment are there and they are irradiated with the uh, electron accelerator which they produce gamma ray and they are all sterilized by the gamma ray now i'll come to another technique very quickly for the physics interest rubber foot bath scattering then proton induced excremation and neutron radiation so i'll just go through so rubber foot bath scattering is a technique <clears throat> that when a ion comes near a nucleus nucleus is positive so it will get repelled by the positive charge of the nuclear so we call it the back scattering so typically 2 to 3 mv alpha particles are used for this exert so this is a technique when helium particles coming near nucleus and it is scattered by the nucleus so nucleus charge state they are depends of uh, will repel and the energy of the incoming this is the incoming the incoming uh, energy and this is the outgoing energy so incoming energy is at 2 mv or 3 mv is used and the outgoing energy is depends upon the well, nucleus from which it is scattered and this is the angle of scattering so the e out depends upon the angle of scattering and atomic number z of the nucleus so this is the technique used 
this ion source then bent here and bombard on the sample and the scattered particle you measure by detecting. So this is called Rutherford best scattering technique. So 3MV helper particles are normal use for detecting for detection of the element. <clears throat> so this is just an example. Suppose this contains aluminum and gold. So gold, uh, the, this uh, A is called M2 uh, minus 1, M2 plus 1. So for gold, this is a very heavy element. So the scattered particle will have less loss of energy. And therefore, if you may record, the, the alpha particles scattered from gold will have high energy, but alpha particles scattered from aluminum will have low energy. So you can distinguish the elements in the sample by measuring the energy of the scattered particle. So these are the kind of factor. So the incoming energy, outgoing energy, and the energy of the particle <coughs> is given by the kinetic factor. So E1 is equal to K into E0, where E0 is the incident energy, and kinetic factor is a aluminum 0.55, and so 2 MV is the energy, and scattered energy will be 1.5. But aluminum, uh, but the gold has gone 0.92 MV. So the gold will have a large energy as compared to the, as the aluminum will have 1 MV energy, but the gold will have more energy scattered. So you can differentiate. So for example, this is a 2 MV particle. So this is our sample, say for example, it has got copper, gold, aluminum. So if you bombard uh, this sample with the ion beam, then the scattered beam will tell you which elements are present here. So gold peak will be different, uh, silver will be different, copper will be different. So suppose you have purchased a gold ring from the market, and if you want to see whether gold is mixed in the gold, uh, the gold ring we purchase, we don't know which element. It should be 100% gold. But nowadays, there may be some mixture, some uh, copper is added or silver is added. But for a common person, difficult to know. But using the for best technique, we can immediately know which elements are present here. But these techniques are not commonly available. In IUC Calcutta, the IUC Delhi, is available. So if you're interested to study, you can use it because it's also very useful for thin film technique. You can use it for measuring the thin film. Suppose you got a multi-layer thin film. So you can see norbium, cobalt. So these are very good technique for measuring the thickness of the thin films. The diffusion of this. So there are different applications of this diffusion technique here. So arsenic, uh, gallium arsenate, if you bombard, you can see arsenic to separate. So now there is the another technique which is called proton induced X-ray emission. So here the principle is here that when the high energy particle is bombarded, it removes the electron from the K shell, and there is the X-rays uh, are produced because the other outer electron goes to inner electron, and X-rays are produced. So the X-rays, if you measure, then X-ray gives you indication. <clears throat> about the elements present in the, uh, in the sample. And therefore, this is the technique. So you have a sample here. You bombard it with the proton and the X-ray is emitted, you measure. And the X-ray spectrum will tell you which type of uh, facilities the uh, elements are present there. So this is the way. So suppose you have bombarded a sample with proton beam, then the X-rays will come on the detector and you, you can measure the... So by measuring the X-rays here, so you have just to put the sample, bombard with the proton beam, then the emitted X-rays will be recorded and you can get the spectrum. And the, each X-ray peak corresponds to a different element and you can find the which elements are present in the sample. So within a five to 10 minutes, you can find the elements in the sample and PPM level, very low element level you can find, which is difficult by the chemical technique. So pixie technique is very useful. So there are medical applications. So there are many applications where you can see the uh, stone bladder, uh, X-ray spectrum of the stone in the body or kidney. Or there are many applications of the, so I just keep it. Then uh, hair also, different group people have a different hair. So you can take the spectrum of the hair. So you can see 50-60%, the FE percentage more as compared to child. So our hair sample also is analyzed by the pixie and you can see this is also used for the forensic because there are many murder cases where some hairs are dropped. So people, uh, their scientists can 
analyze the hair and can find out and can calculate the elements and elements present in the hair and then they can find out which are there. which are the for the blood sample so i'll just keep only i'll just show you these are the element present in the rice lead then petrol chip so there are many facilities so trace elements in the atmosphere i will just cover this these are very important that uh, this is very important in application that you take out the proton beam from the accelerator and suppose you there is a statue of the made of bronze so you irradiate with the statue with the proton beam and do take the x ray from it so there are x rays are there so because you cannot cut the uh, statue and it becomes very expensive and nobody will allow you so the x ray technique is used for the analysis of the you spectrum and you can find which elements are present in the statue so ancient statue are analyzed for example eyes <clears throat> there is eyes of the statue which uh, elements are used in the statue we don't know so these are the way the elements are the pottery what uh, which color are used so you can see the pottery which type of elements are no script this is written in the golden so it looks like they written the golden gold ink but uh, when you analyze so the strip is read with the proton and x rays are measured so you can see that the ancient script does not have gold at all but it looks like a golden but the elements we present are zinc lead bromine copper so the ancient people have made the ink looks like a gold but it does not contain gold at all similarly coins we have a coins here <coughs> which looks like a golden coin but again when you take the spectrum of the coin you don't see any gold inside so these are the ancient techniques you people have used it looks like oh gold but when you analyze by the pixie technique you will find there is no gold inside that so this is the spectrum of a gun shot because in the forensic the gun shot also used so there are many techniques here so there are other techniques which are used for the analysis of the explosive class material landmine so we had a project of landmine analysis so the explosive class material contains lead carbon oxygen and they are can be analyzed very easily by the neutron we when you bombard a sample on a neutron the x rays are emitted prompt x ray and hydrogen will emit 2.2 carbon will emit 4.4 nitrogen will emit 4 so if the by measuring the x ray you can find whether the sample is contains explosive or not so on the ship the x neutron radiography neutron are bombarded on the sample and the x rays were gamma rays emitted by sample is measured and you can find out whether the contains uh, this explosive class material or the carbon oxygen that element so these are the technique used for this sample so uh, we had a project for measuring making a portable neutron generator so if your landmine is there so if the neutrons are falling on the landmine the x rays the gamma rays will be there and you can detect the landmine of course we could not uh, complete the project but we still want to use this technique for detection of the landmine by using the neutron so thank you very much for your hearing if anybody has got any question i will be happy to answer uh, thank you so much sir for your valuable speech Uh, thank you once again for giving your valuable insight on low energy particle accelerators and applications thank you. you your noble knowledge definitely boosted our thinking ability sir i am sure your address will help a lot in understanding the particle accelerators in their use and application there is no doubt that our audience are also enjoyed lots so thank you sir yeah, thank once you. again thank you thank you so now Uh, this session is open for question answer so if there is any questions so the participants can unmute and they may ask directly uh, may i request to maharnavar sir if there is some questions asked by yes, the, yes sir please some uh, participant asked the question ha huh. uh, yes. uh, one participant that is a tamil selvan from kerala he okay. asked how increase energy after increase the number of orbit in a race track microtron ah uh, because yes sir yes continue 
because the electron goes back again to the cavity all the time after uh, moving one orbit it enters the cavity again is screen is available there yes sir yes i'll just show you because the electron will enter the cavity and gain energy so each time it enters the cavity when after one orbit it enters the cavity and it take the energy <clears throat> Rest track microtons. Ah yes, I will just show you. Yes, so you can see that the orbit. Uh, yes. There is only one cavity here, so electron rotates in the magnetic field and comes back in the cavity. So if the electric field is proper, the again electron energy is given by the microwave power. So energy becomes double. Again, it will go because if the magnetic field is constant, energy is more. The orbit radius will be more. So again, it will come back to cavity. Again, it gains energy. So energy of electron. So energy is given to electron in the cavity. This is the answer. Uh, okay, yes, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. Another uh, yes. one of our student, uh, Rutuja Nalawde, she is asking one question, sir. Gamma rays can't pass through lead. Why, sir? Because the attenuation coefficient is large. Because the attenuation coefficient of each element is uh, different. And high Z elements have got large uh, uh, probability of removing electron from the atom, and therefore they are absorbed there completely. So high Z elements absorb uh, gamma ray, and low Z elements absorb neutron. Okay, sir. Thank you. The question on that, uh, the Amol Pradeshi asked the why only low Z atomic, uh, sorry, low Z material are used uh, to stop neutron. Because I hear that uh, lead are generally used, which is a higher Z. So I think you answered that question. Right. Can I can I take the next question? Uh, right. Pritiza from Gujarat. She is asked how to increase electron energy in uh, acceler accelerators. Actually, there are two types of accelerator. As I shown you, first accelerator. So this is accelerator. So if you have a AC, this is AC electric accelerator. So the suppose we have a electron or ion, we can we have to change the phase. So in the gap, the particle whenever it crosses the gap, it will get energy. And whenever it is in the tube, it does not see any electrical field. So only when passing the gap, it gets energy. And each gap, it gets energy. And therefore, energy of the particle increases continuously. And in the case of DC field, this is a DC accelerator. There, the DC field is constant, and the ion goes, uh, the electron goes from negative potential to ground potential. So it will gain energy continuously. And this is the ion. It goes from positive potential to ground. So it will gain energy, and energy is equal to potential difference. This is energy gain. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, one of the curious question asked by Kalva Kalvathi Raja. Uh, the question is, sir, when gamma rays pass to food, does it have any adverse effect to a woman? No, luckily there is because the scientists have worked for more than twenty years on this, and after that only government has permitted to use the gamma ray for the food preservation. So the, so far there is no report of spoiling the food. Atom by gamma ray, it only kills the germs. So all the germs are uh, killed by the gamma ray or X-ray, and it's very safe for eating. And therefore, government has permitted only few foods for uh, uh, eating, and not all the foods. But mangoes are there, all fruits are there, bananas are there. So in Maharashtra government has permitted this uh, groundnut, pigeon pea, rice, mustard, jute. They are permitted by the government. So you can uh, eat it without any problem, and all the food, as I told you, when you purchase from market, there there will be label. This label will be there on the packet, so it will tell you that whatever you are eating has been irritated by the gamma rays. Okay. But there is no danger. Very easy to. Uh, uh, one uh, another question, uh, Rutuja Pongiyal from Haryana. 
she is asked five magnets are used in accelerators very good question because it is a linear accelerator your length will go on increasing with the particles i have shown you if i want to set any accelerator then i have to go on adding uh, tube one after other it will go to one one kilometer or two kilometer length to get one five mv of six mv energy but in the case of circular accelerator <clears throat> so here the length is because if you use linear accelerator which i shown earlier the length will be very large like this so if i go on adding the tube it will go up to 1 km so instead of using uh, length linear accelerator if you use magnetic field then the particle can turn in the magnetic field and again come back say for example here or here the particle will come back again to the cavity and again gain energy so in the small space by bending the electron or ion mostly this is used for the electron used also for ion so the small space by bending the trajectory we can increase the energy of the particle so length is not a problem here there is an advantage of using the magnet for bending the trajectory uh -huh. one last question uh yan nagarajan from tamil nadu he is asked is there is uh, any positron accelerators in uh, accelerators is available if a, uh, any uh, what is the applications positron uh, is a very useful uh, particle for medical applications or for finding defects because what happens positron cannot live for a very long time but it can live if there is nothing inside outside because positron always look for an electron and positron electron join together and they annihilate and two gamma rays are emitted so this technique is used for uh, brain scanning or many medical application uh, because they, whenever there is a defect the positron lifetime will change and their positrons are used for the medical application and also for making a study of the defects in the material so positron accelerators are rarely available not in india ig car has a small small accelerator for the positron because there is a sodium 22 the radioisotope which emits positron there are copper there are some radioisotope which emit positron but the energy is uh, beta ray energy is not constant so in the accelerator we can accelerate the positron but the problem here is that the lifetime of the positron is very small the moment they come uh, interact with the electron they get annihilated but the answer to question there are some positron accelerators and but they are very few in the world one positron accelerator exists in the ig car kalpakam okay. thank you so much sir for uh, your wonderful uh, session yes. sir uh, one last question from right. our college student she is asking right. one question anita londe yeah. we can we can use gamma ray radiography and neutron radiography in excav excavation in excavation excavation yeah yeah excavation means uh, actually neutron radiography and excavation because excavation you want to go and find what is inside so neutron radiography is not used but neutron radiation is used for drilling the hole for oil because the oil mines are there to find whether oil is there or not the hole is drilled and neutron sources are put inside the hole and if there is oil the prompt gamma rays will be emitted as i shown you for the uh, explosives and so but not radiography is not used for that elemental analysis can be used. for excavation okay. okay sir thank you so much sir for your wonderful session and wonderful thank lecture you, you. we uh, we and our part and again thank uh, management of the college principal and all of you for uh, inviting me to give this talk i really enjoyed and thank, thank you so much i look forward for opportunity to visit your college again yes sir definitely we are waiting for your visit sir uh, thank you once again sir thank you. because we and our uh participants are really enjoyed your okay. talk 
Uh, they also comment inside the chat box. Very excellent presentation. We have learned a lot regarding pelletron, cyclotron, microwave generation, and okay. so many things we learn. And uh, you are really, uh, uh, your knowledge is really helpful for us, sir. Thank you once again. Thank so, you very much. Yeah, sir. And thank, thank you, you, thank you once again for giving your valuable time. No, no, sir. Yeah, yeah, sir. Thank you thank once you again. Much, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. So. There is one small announcement is that uh, we have take one 15 minute break, 10 to 15 minute break. So we will join at 12.40 uh, p.m. sharply because we need a one small break. So we will sharply join at 12.40. Okay, so uh, our another speaker is already available here. So we will take one small break. So we will join at 12.40 p.m. sharply. Thank you.
So we will start our next session uh, after 10 minutes. So we will sharply start our next session at 12 and 40 p.m.
गुड आफ्टरनून फाते सर फाते सर आवाज येतोय गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून ओके ओके सर सर शाल वी स्टार्ट सर येस 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 आय एम रेडी ओके सर ओके ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून वन एंड ऑल वन अगेन लेडीज एंड जेंटलमेन वेलकम बैक मैन मे आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर बलबीम महारनवर टू इंट्रोड्यूस अवर सेकंड इस्टीम्ड स्पीकर फॉर द डे डॉक्टर डी एम फासे सर सो आई रिक्वेस्ट टू बलबीम महानवर सर प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस अबाउट दी फासे सर hello so i am very happy to introduce a very eminent personality uh, dr uh, fase sir dr dm fase uh, so <clears throat> i have read here a short bio dot of uh, dr dm fase so dr dm fase completed his uh, phd degree in uh, pune uh, from uh, university of pune in march uh, 1989 sir have total more than 25 uh, year teaching as well as uh, research experience he is a subject uh, thought our pre phd courses like uh, experimental techniques thin films vacuum technology and mtk mtech courses like uh, analytical instruments uh, transducers very large scale integration that is a uh, fls uh, flsi devices his area of uh, research is a uh, condensed matter physics and specialization of research field is a thin film multi layers magnetic oxide thin films instrumentation related to synchrotron radiation beam line and thin film and multi layers sir have currently working on dilute magnetic uh, semiconductor for application in uh, spintronics sir have recognized the phd guide for devi ahilya vishwavidyalay indore under his guidance 10 student completed phd and 3 hr progress sir have published about more than 425 research paper in international uh, referred peer reviewed journals the citations are about 5560 and h index is 35 and h10 index is 152 sir have completed several research project from various governmental agencies in a uh, uh, 2005 sir completed major research project on time resolved x-ray scattering using energy um, uh, bright light for research pro- uh, process funded uh, about uh, 30 lakhs uh, amount is there by department of science and technology with international collaboration sir also completed another project in 2011 that is the polarized light beaming on indus 2 bending magnet uh, magnet source for mcd and pes experiments uh, about amount is 4 crore 73 lakhs department of science and technology government of india new delhi sir has uh, uh, developed the first operational uh, photo electron spectroscopy beam line on indus one synchrotron source at uh, raja ramanna center for advanced technology in the madhya pradesh also sir developed polarized light beam line on indus 2 synchrotron source for x ray absorption spectroscopy and x ray magnetic source uh, circular dichroism on indus 2 at same institute sir has also developed the ultra high vacuum de- uh, electron beam thin film system for multi layer deposition and pulse laser deposition system at department of atomic energy indore sir has awarded of uh, uh, actually sir have uh, fellow of maharashtra uh, uh, science academy physics academy 
sir has got group of achievement award from department of atomic energy for development of uh, beam line currently he is a uh, sir is a uh, scientist h and a center director of ugc department of atomic energy indore madhya pradesh government of india thank you thank you so much sir so may i request to fasi sir please uh, share your valuable speech in front of all the audience thank you sir yes sir screen this day sir screen is visible is it in ppt mode no yes sir yes sir so very good afternoon first of all i am thankful to the principal of uh, dada patil mahavidyalay and uh, convener of this uh, one day workshop for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and also i am thankful to the first speaker that professor boraskar who is my guru so basically two days ago we have celebrated the teachers day so i am very uh, thankful to the college for giving me the opportunity on this occasion of this uh, near to this teachers day and you they have arranged my talk after my the teachers so he, basically he is the dronacharya of this accelerator business and i am just a small part of that thing I, my knowledge is very less as compared to the professor boraskar so if you see any mistakes in my thing you just point out me because it is very difficult to talk in front of you after professor boraskar lecture so let us try first i will try my best to give you the glimpses of our inter synchrotron radiation activity at rrk at indor which we have developed for the university as well as the college people research and to update uh, their research quality in that of kind of basically i am uh, belongs to the ugc da consortium for scientific research indor it is the research institute founded by professor bede the ex vice chancellor of uh, pune university in 19 uh, in 1989 and i joined this uh, i did my phd in 1989 i i joined this institute in 1993 so from 1993 i joined i went to the indor from pune and uh, then i started this uh, radiation synchrotron radiation activity which is related to the accelerator kind of research uh, and then i will tell you how we have progressed uh, in that direction and from 1993 till uh, this uh, 2021 what we have done and what is the basically the uh, facilities which we have developed for the college people as well as the university researchers as students as well as the faculty who are interested to do the condensed matter physics research in this accelerator based research so i will tell you about the facilities and i will first i will tell you about the uh, our institute also the the title of my talk is basically indus synchrotron radiation source and its application basically i belong to ugc de consortium for scientific research indore so our basic mandate is to promote encourage and support the research using mega facility the mega facility means basically you know that in our country department of atomic energy has developed a lot of mega facilities basic uh, one is at the brc one that is dhruva reactors which gives the neutron beam then uh, in at indore it is basically the indus synchrotron which give the photon beam and in kolkata there is a basically the cyclotron which will give the electron beam there and uh, others are basically igcar and ipr 
In the IGCAR, basically, again, there are the reactors, and in IPR, there is basically plasma related research is there. So these are basically the mega facilities developed by the Department of Atomic Energy in our country. But uh, if you see that thing, because Dep Department of Atomic Energy is very special department which comes under the Prime Minister, and it is not easily accessible these facilities for the normal uh, university or college researchers or students who are doing the high level uh, higher education in uh, just like PhD as well as a master of. Uh, philosophy type kind of thing. So research oriented degrees, uh, wherever they are possible, but they are uh, not getting the access to the Department of Atomic Energy research facilities, which are very big and which are very important as far as the high, high quality research is concerned. So these facilities are basically, one is neutron beam facility, Dhruva reactor, Indus synchrotron, cyclotron, and low energy. So in 1989, Professor Bide, had went uh, uh, to the uh, then prime minister and uh, discussed the issue about the, this facility and why these facilities are not uh, available for the university researcher. So he uh, discussed the matter and he came out, come out with the proposal that one institute will be founded for this type of work. And this uh, institute will work as a mediator between the Department of Atomic Energy and the UGC. So that is basically the UGC DAE consortium, our name is there. So it is basically the part of UGC, the institute is UGC, but we are using the mega facilities of DA. So that is basically the UGC DA consortium. And, and, and we are basically not doing only our own research. It is our mandate that we will give the facilities and also the we develop the, some facilities for the research for the university as well as research uh, scientists from the colleges. And then uh, we will give the access to them. And this will be given, uh, the funding will be by the UGC for our institute. And that's why we are not charging any rupees for any type of characterization, for any type of help which we are giving to the university researcher. So that is the basically the thing. I think uh, most of the, uh, the audience know the, our institute, or maybe they can go to visit our a website and they can find out what is what are the facilities uh, recent facilities are there and other kind of thing and what is the procedure to get uh, the to apply for the any kind of measurement or any kind of preparation of sample and so and it is basically completely free of charge so no money is required any college people in any ugc approved college or any ugc approved university scientist or student can come to our institute they will be uh, given the facility for the research. So that is basically the, our mandate. We, and basically the mandate is to add the value to the research carried out in our universities and help in realization of uh, scientific ideas by providing an innovating research ambience through our scientists and facilities. So this is the basically UGCDA consortium mandate. So it is basically the first unique national experiment which based on the synergetic relationship with Department of Atomic Energy, it has given a new direction and meaning to collaborative research. So naturally, once you use the DAE facility, then you have to collaborate with the DAE scientists. So that is basically the new direction of collaboration with DAE, then sharing expertise. Suppose you have very good idea, but you don't have any uh, facilities or you don't have any uh, kind of thing to work out on that idea, then you can discuss it with the DA people, DA scientists, and then they can uh, give the approach there for the experimentation. So this type of sharing expertise and facilities to nurture universities to create a wealth by doing impact making research. So that's why one can increase the level of the research. Otherwise, uh, if you don't have the facilities, high-grade facilities, up-to-date facilities, then you cannot go for the very impact-making research. And nowadays, you will see that the normal type of research is not useful. You have to have some societal application. You should have some high impact uh, of this thing that uh, you can have the very good quality, not a normal journal publication, but a very good quality journal publication, which has a very good impact factor. So that kind of things are basically requ required by the university uh, authorities and other kind of things for the PhD degree. So that's why this institute is basically the unique exercise where basically you can have the uh, uh, get the facilities to do the high impact research. So 
you can have the tap into the enormous reservoir of the talent in our because you know that in india there are basically more than 300 400 universities by the ugc and every university you cannot uh, get the funding for the equipment grant and other kind of thing so you cannot uh, also uh, suppose you get the some grant for some good equipment you cannot maintain that equipment long time long term basis because you don't have the money for the maintenance grant also because the, uh, the number of students are very high and then budget is very low so you cannot maintain that thing so that is basically what we are doing we are maintaining the equipment we are maintaining the this big facility and we are giving access to the you uh, people from universities and colleges to work on this uh, so that is basically the centralized kind of thing so it is basically the centralized laboratory of the ugc where one can have the access for any kind of experiment so this is basically the our user group support you can see that uh, overall all india you can see that these are basically uh, we have three center one is at the indore one is at the mumbai and one is at the kolkata so green line is green uh, dot is for the indore center you can see that all the, our user community are distributed all over the india from jammu kashmir to the kerala and as well as from gujarat to the here nagaland you can see that all the people from these regions are getting access to our facilities so now i will come to the my main talk so the plan of the talk is basically i will introduce to in the synchrotron i am thankful to professor boraskar he has already introduced the synchrotron uh, in his lecture so he has uh, but till for the completeness i will start from the introduction of the in the synchrotron then i will tell about our first initiative of our uh, institute that first beam line which we have developed photo electron spectroscopy for photo electron spectroscopy on indus 1 synchrotron there are basically two indus uh, synchrotron that already professor boraskar has told you then uh, some results on uh, this uh, first beam line what kind of work one can do using this uh, first beam line that is uh, ps beam line and then uh, i will tell you what are the, basically our institute has developed the two beam lines one on indus 1 and one on indus 2 and other institute that is rr cad brc they have already also have the beam lines on this indus 1 and indus 2 so basically i will tell you about what type of beam lines are available and these are also available to the all university and college researcher so that's why i will give the introduction about the other beam lines also so what kind of work one can do using the beam lines on indus 1 and indus 2 and then i will tell you about the, our second beam line how we have developed the second beam line and what is the uniqueness of that second beam line and what are basically the problems one can handle on that beam line and then finally i will conclude with my future plan uh, of our institute and then conclude the lecture so this is my plan of talk the first uh, i will tell you what is basically the synchrotron source so synchrotron source is the electromagnetic ray you have already heard about the accelerator there are two types of accelerator one is linear accelerator and one is the circular accelerator here we are focusing on the circular accelerator so you can see that synchrotron source is basically the electromagnetic radiation emitted when electrons moving at velocities close to the speed of light are forced to change direction under the action of magnetic field so in circular uh, accelerator you will see that there are the magnet to bend the beam so basically electron beam is moving in the circle and once it is reached to the speed of light when it bend at at some angle so at each bending there is basically the loss of energy and that energy loss is come out as a beam of photon so photon is coming out from all each bending magnet So these are these are the basically bending magnet which are bending the electron beam and because of the bending of the electron beam the energy loss is there and that energy loss is basically come out as a come as a form of beam so that is basically called the synchrotron radiation source so what is basically the uh, use of this synchrotron radiation source so this is basically the electromagnetic radiation is emitted in a narrow so this is basically in narrow cone just like uh, our laser uh, source and then uh, it comes out at a tangent to the electron orbit so if electron orbit is a circle then as a tangent to the uh, normal to that circle basically the beam is coming out so at each normal you will see that the beam is coming out so at a time uh, the number of uh, whatever the number of the, this uh, bending magnets are there so that type of uh, that number of beam lines are possible to develop on the synchrotron so at a time you can have the different experiment parallelly running at around the synchrotron radiation source so that is the basically the 
uh, unique uh, ness of the synchrotron radiation it is not like that in accelerator basically once the, we have the linear accelerator once you have some type of accelerator there basically the only one beam line is uh, one experiment is possible here basically the depending upon the radius of your uh, curvature of this electron beam the number of uh, ports are available for the different type of beam and all these experiments are basically simultaneously possible not necessary that only single beam uh, line will be the operational at a time all the beam lines wherever the beam plan you can put the beam line i will tell you what is basically the beam line and then uh, uh, you will understand that what are the basically the uniqueness of this synchrotron radiation so synchrotron light is basically unique in its intensity so intensity is very high and the brilliance and it can be generated across the range of the electromagnetic spectrum so what is basically electromagnetic spectrum it is basically from the gamma ray to the high energy ray so that's why basically you can generate the gamma ray you can generate the soft x ray you can generate the vacuum ultraviolet you can generate the ultraviolet you can generate the infrared you can generate the soft x ray you can generate the hard x ray so this is basically the thing which we can generate. that will depend upon the what is the energy of rotation of this electron beam so it on depending upon the electron beam uh, energy your output uh, photon beam energy will be decided so how one can compare the intensity of the synchrotron source here i have put the in y axis i have put the brightness of the beam and then uh, x axis uh, you can see that there are different so candle you can see that candle normally which gives us the right uh, about 10 to 5 photons per second kind of brightness if you go to the 60 watt light bulb then it is around 10 raised to 6 if you go to the laboratory level x ray tube then you will get the photon beam that is x ray beam of of the order of 10 raised to 8 to 10 raised to 10 and which is basically equivalent to the sun only thing is that uh, the sun uh, intensity which we are getting it is not the focus intensity so that's why we are getting the around uh, the x ray tube is equivalent to the sun otherwise if the sun if you focus the sun near to that uh, point where the sun intensity is coming so there you will get the very high intense right brightness of that uh, sun's light so we can compare that x ray tube is equivalent to the normal sunlight reaching at the earth not at the uh, which is emitting at the sun and then uh, what about the synchrotron radiation the synchrotron radiation is four orders greater than your x ray tube or sun so that is basically the 10 raised to 14 to 10 raised to 15 is normal bending magnet kind of thing and then there are special type of magnetic devices to use use for the bending the beam so that will give the in, intensity of around 10 raised to 19 kind of photons per second so this is the basically the intensity ratio as compared to the, our laboratory source so if you see that it is basically the 10 raised to 8 from 10 raised to 8 to you are going reaching up to the 10 raised to 19 or 18 that means you are basically the at very high intensity source so naturally whatever the time you will required in the laboratory uh, frame or in laboratory to do some experiment naturally your time will be very small and as well as your resolution of any experiment which you do using the photon beam of the synchrotron sorry so basically we are talking about the intensity of 10 to 18 photon per second 18 to 19 that kind of thing so you will realize now that how intense is this synchrotron radiation source then what are the advantages of synchrotron source over lab source the synchrotron radiation source you will see that it has the continuous spectrum from infrared to the x ray so all kind of this thing in laboratory you know that for example uv visible you have to require some uv lamp for x ray you will require some x ray tube for uh, infrared you will require some infrared source so that kind of and you will have the different apparatus for the infrared uv x ray as kind of spectroscopy but here you will see that the whole spectrum is there from infrared to the x ray in this synchrotron radiation so so that is the advantage of the synchrotron source over the lab source and then another uh, advantage is the emission of this source 
it is not diverging source just like our sun uh, from sun you are also getting the all electromagnetic spectrum but it is basically diverging and at when it reach at the earth its intensity is very low so but here basically you are getting the focus kind of thing just like laser with basically the emission is in very small solid angle that is 0.1 milli rad so that immediately after the bending magnet port you will get the focus beam and intense source of that type so that is basically advantage and once you collect that source and you can reflect or you can uh, manipulate that source according to your uh, requirement and put it into the your sample there then you can have the very good kind of spectroscopy with high intense source and another advantage of this source is it is basically the pulse time structure it has the pulse time structure so you can do the time resolved experiment also so you can have some a time resolved experiment if you have want to do some time resolved reaction chemical reaction then also this type of source is basically useful because it source itself has a time pulse time structure and another and most important advantage of this source is it has also the polarizability so this source is not only the uh, normal uh, unpolarized source it is it, in the plane of the electron orbit in which electrons are moving if you tap that source in that orbit or that uh, that plane then you will get the linear light linear polarized light and if you go above and below of this plane of orbit then you will get the elliptical polarizer so polarization the natural polarization is already there in this source so that is basically you can use so wherever the application is there for the polarized source is required one can get the directly from the synchrotron radiation source you don't have to use to for any polarizer to convert the your main uh, normal source to the polarized source so that is also one of the advantage of this synchrotron radiation source now how one can use this source so you know that uh, already we have heard from the professor boraskar lecture that in accelerator is a very big business here basic uh, high voltages are there then high radiation uh, kind of things are there so basically these sources are inside the uh, basically radiation shield are there and so you cannot work near to this accelerator source you have to remotely work on this accelerator source or uh, you have to use some shielding kind of thing so that is basically you cannot go directly near to the accelerator there whether it is linear or whether it is circular so directly where the beam is coming out from that port there near why you cannot put your sample or you cannot go and do the experiment there so that's why one intermediate device is required so you have to carry that beam from at some place where basically the radiation hazardous is not there so you can tap that beam you can collect that beam and then you can focus it or you can because it is a photon beam so photon beam can be used by mirror one can use the reflection though by reflection your intensity will go down but you know that already the very high intensity is there so it will not reduce like in our laboratory kind of thing it will reduce somewhat uh, maybe from 10 days to 18 19 it will go to the 10 days to 16 or 15 kind of thing but it will not go to the 10 days to 8 or 10 like in laboratory kind of thing so it is again advantage and but uh, but you can do the experiment in very short time because of the high intensity so that's why basically the intermediate gadget is required in between the synchrotron radiation source and your experimental station so whatever experiment you are going to plan to do with the synchrotron then there basically the experimental station will be there for example in x-ray diffraction your x-ray diffractometer will be there for photo emission photo electron spectroscopy your photo electron spectrometer is there for ir spectroscopy your ir spectrometer will be there for uh, uh, other kind of thing gamma ray or uh, this time be your gamma radiation uh, irradiation chamber will be there so that kind of thing is there so but uh, where you can put your sample so that will be uh, there will be the intermediate devices that is called the beam line so in between source and experimental station the beam line is there so there are basically the three kind of people's expertise is required one basically the accelerator expertise they are already available with the rr cat people they are doing this source and they are basically they have already developed the synchrotron radiation source so they have the expertise and manpower they can run this source and they will give us the beam but then to tap that beam and to collect that beam and to transfer it to the our till our experimental station the beam line uh, designing is necessary so that beam line designing will depend upon the what type of experimental station or experiment you are going to plan 
so that is basically depending upon the external rotation what kind of because basically here basically the complete electromagnetic spectrum is available from the source so there that complete electromagnetic spectrum is not necessary for the all type of experiment so suppose if somebody is interested only in x ray diffraction he will only tap the x ray part of that thing, hard x ray part suppose somebody is interested in photo electron spectroscopy he will only tap the photo uh, that uh, Uh, vacuum ultraviolet kind of thing or uh, some soft x ray kind of thing because you know that photo electron spectroscopy in laboratory you do with the aluminum k alpha or, or magnesium k alpha or helium line helium light source also so basically that kind of uh, uh, radiation is basically called a soft x ray or vacuum ultraviolet so one can tap only that part of the radiation. you don't have to worry about the gamma rays as well as from the hard x ray kind of thing but you can tap so how one can tap that thing so there are basically the beam line experts so beam line uh, designing is basically necessary in between the source and your experimental station so what are kind of that beam lines so there are basically that this is the typical beam line arrangement here basically you can see the source electrons are moving and because of the moving uh, electron the photon is coming out then photon basically i have put one aperture here and then i have collected that whatever that photon beam is coming total electromagnetic spectrum that i am collecting on a mirror it is not a normal mirror it is basically the some figure is there they are basically spherical mirror tangential mirror then toroidal mirror ellipsoidal mirror depending upon the shape of the geometry of that mirror it is basically called the uh, that kind of mirror so here basically you will see that the toroidal mirror is there toroidal mirror is taking that radiation and it is focusing on the another focusing mirror and then it is going to the Uh, just other focusing uh, this thing and then you will see that it is reaching to the slit and then uh, again it uh, enter into the slit coming out from the slit and here basically the grating is there normally we know that grating will give, uh, divide the electromagnetic spectrum into the some kind of diffraction energy so you depending upon the required photon energy or photon wavelength required for your experiment what kind of experiment you are going to do you have to put the grating or the crystal normally in x ray diffraction we use the crystal for hard x ray you use the crystals and for soft x ray or vacuum ultraviolet we use the grating so there are basically two types of beam line one is grating based beam line if you want to have the output in the vacuum ultraviolet or soft x ray then uh, you will require the grating and if you want the hard x ray kind of thing then you will require the crystal only thing is that here we do will not have the one crystal here basically we have the two crystals so it is called basically the double crystal so you have to monochromatize uh, the whatever in, uh, input radiation coming out from the synchrotron radiation so for as a monochromator one can use the diffraction grating or one can use the uh, crystals so for hard x ray one can use the crystal and for soft x ray one can use the diffraction grating so these are basically the beam lines design and depending upon the requirement one can do the design of this this is our uh, basically rr cat indus complex where basically the two synchrotron radiation sources are there already i think professor bhoraskar has showed this uh, transparency uh, the starting point is you require the electron beam so electron beam is basically came from the microtron so microtron is here it gives the energy of the electron to the 20 mev and then it will goes uh, 20 mv and 30 mA current is there and then from this transfer line tl1 it is going into the this circular accelerator it is called the basically the booster synchrotron in booster synchrotron there is a possibility uh, facility of increasing the energy of this electron to the 550 mv so from 20 mv this booster synchrotron can increase the energy of the synchro uh, electron to the 550 mv so for there are basically the two storage ring one is indus 1 and another one is the indus 2 so indus 1 is the small storage ring it has the 450 mv 100 mA uh, specification and uh, indus 2 is the big uh, bigger circle or big diameter uh, ring it has the energy of 2.5 gv and the 300 mA current so this is basically the bigger uh, circular uh, synchrotron and this is the smaller uh, circular beam here we only the four electromagnets are there to bend the magnet so that's why it is not exactly as a circle it you will see that it is just like a but actually the electron path is circular 
though you see that it is just like a rectangular kind of thing but it is basically the circular so it is small radius a circle and it is a bigger radius circle and at each bending magnet these are the red colors are basically bending magnet here and here basically the blue color blue and yellow are bending magnets at that four corner so here are only four bending magnets and here are basically the 20 uh, 16 bending bending magnets are there so at each bending magnet one can put our beam line any beam line so at each bending magnet basically beam is coming out and you can tap that beam and you can put your beam line here here basically that's why and one uh, port is basically closed because of the transfer line is there because the electron beam has to be injected in this uh, this accelerator circular accelerator so here this transfer line two will introduce the beam into the indus one from the same booster synchrotron when it reach to the 450 mev so it is 450 mev after reaching the 450 mev the beam is transferred to the indus one synchrotron and once it is reached to the 550 mev then it is go to the this synchrotron this bigger indus two synchrotron and then again it is increase energy up to the 2.5 gv so from 550 mev to 2.5 gv this indus two uh, storage ring itself will use to increase the accelerator energy here basically the water energy is given from this booster synchrotron that 450 mev the same uh, energy will be continuously uh, stored in this indus one synchrotron so these are basically the two synchrotron sources available by the department of atomic energy at rr cat indore on which which are there are various beam lines people have developed and we have also developed two beam line so we will now go to the application of this synchrotron beam and we will see what type of beam lines are available on this indus one and indus two so on beam line on indus one basically there is a soft x ray reflectivity the energy range is 40 angstrom to the 1000 angstrom then this is the red color with our beam line that dl2 on indus one it is for photo electron spectroscopy it is angle integrated photo electron spectroscopy so you will get the valence band spectroscopy as well as some shallow core level uh, electron spectroscopy using this thing so energy range is again 60 angstrom to the 1600 angstrom another beam line third beam line is basically the angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy the angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy it is by the brc and then normal photophysics absorption beam line and other that is also by brc that is from 500 angstrom to 3500 angstrom and then high resolution vacuum ultraviolet absorption spectroscopy it is again 1300 angstrom to the 300 so these are basically the five beam lines are available no and now recently basically they have added one infrared beam line so that is also possible on infrared spectroscopy is also possible on indus one so this is the uh, of, of indus one so and now i will tell you about our beam line it is the photo electron spectroscopy beam line so i have already told you that the accelerator is inside this shielding one this is basically the blue color is uh, metallic shield then uh, this uh, bricks are there a brick structure is there that green color brick structure is there that is also shielding so lot of shielding is there because inside there actually the electron is accelerated up to the 450 mev so there will be the radiation uh, coming out from the uh, different part of the this uh, positions of this accelerator so that's why one shielding is necessary and we have tapped the this beam which is coming from the indus one in this chamber where basically the our first mirror component is located so this is the first pre mirror chamber we call it as a pre mirror chamber where the beam is tapped from the synchrotron radiation so complete electromagnetic radiation total beam is basically tapped in this pre mirror chamber and then this mirror is basically at the 4.5 degree angle so it red reflected in this angular position and this is basically the here you have the slit so entrance slit is there and enter from entrance slit this beam will get passed and this is our the grating monochromatic chamber in this grating basically we are having the three gratings and so the beam is from this pre mirror is get focused at the this slit and the beam is coming at this grating so this is the grating chamber which is again accepting the beam from the entrance slit 
So three gratings will cover the whole energy range from the 60 angstrom to the 1600 angstrom. So three gratings are required. One is basically the uh, 200 lines per sec, uh, mm. Then uh, it is 400 lines per mm, and then 1200 lines per mm. So three gratings are introduced, and basically you will see that all these are under the metallic shielding or metallic pipeline because this energy range which we are talking about it uh, basically the vacuum ultraviolet or soft x-ray so vacuum ultraviolet or soft x-ray energy or photon beam is basically naturally absorbed in the air so one cannot do this experiment in air just like in our x-ray diffraction the hard x-ray x-ray is not absorbed in the air that's why we require some lead kind of shielding and other kind of thing but this Normal soft exterior or uh, vacuum ultraviolet beam is not uh, travel uh, in the air. So that's why basically the vacuum line is tube line is necessary. So whole line is basically covered. The whole chambers are connected by the pipeline and which is under the ultra high vacuum. So this is completely ultra high vacuum uh, chamber. All these chambers are ultra vacuum. This complete pipeline is also ultra vacuum. So and it is connected to the electron accelerator storage. Ring. So that storage ring is also under the ultra high vacuum. So vacuum experts are also important here, played a ma major role while uh, while running this experiment. Because the vacuum expert is necessary where some suppose small leak is there or something is there, then your uh, your vacuum will also go, will go down and your uh, X-ray whatever uh, beam is coming from this industry or will also get uh, lost. So that's why the vacuum is very important. So you have to do the experiment in the order of minus nine to minus 10 torque. So that is the basically the vacuum order inside this chamber. And then uh, this beam is uh, monochromatized beam is get focus on the post mirror. So another chamber is there, mirror chamber, which will, because beam is coming in the straight direction, in the horizontal direction, it is bent by this pre mirror in this uh, 4.5 degree. And this uh, again grating is in the opposite direction it will bend that beam again to the down degree so downward uh, the beam is reflected and it is again the mirror is again at 4.5 degrees so beam is the monochromatized beam after the post mirror is coming in the straight direction so this is the basically the all this is the beam line and now one can put your experimental station near to this post mirror and one can use the photon beam so i will show you the next is the experimental station so this is the our normal photoelectron spectrometer and the beam is coming in this direction and sample our, one can put your sample so we are very far away from the actual accelerator and in between there is a shielding wall there is a metallic shielding is there then pipeline is there monochromatic chambers are there pre mirror chamber are there so we are very far away from the accelerator so that then one can have any user or any student or any scientist who are working on this thing he can work nearby this experimentation just like our photoelectron spectrometer in our laboratory but in laboratory we have uh, basically on one flange mounted x-ray source here basically the beam is coming from that pipeline full whole beam line so that is basically the complete beam line for the photoelectron spectroscopy which is developed by our ugc da csr in 2004 from since 2004 this beam line is basically is working and continuously ultra high vacuum is available inside this thing and lot of users are basically came to use this beam line until it is functional and what type of experiment one can do using this thing that i will show you in our next slide so i will not tell you the specification it is not important as far as the users are concerned specification of beam line So this is, you can see the actual Indus 1 accelerator. So these are the four bending magnets. And here is basically the transfer line. From here, electron beam is coming. Electron beam is injected into this storage ring. And then it gets uh, circulated. And the energy is basically the 455 energy. And whenever it passes through this bending magnet bending, so here it is basically the beam is coming. So you can see that the beam lines are connected. There are various beam lines. One beam line is going here to here. One beam line is going from here to here. One beam line, it is our beam line. You can see that it is coming and it is going to the there. This way, and here basically we cannot put the beam line because here transfer line is there. One can put beam line, but that one has to do the proper arrangement and one cannot go beyond this thing because the hall has the limitation. So that's why only three bending magnets are used for the beam line. 
So this is the basically the index one storage ring, and this is basically another view of our beam line, the same view beam line in another view. Here you can see that all these things simultaneously. Experimental tension is here. Here basically the post mirror. Here basically the grating. Here pre mirror, and one can do the experiment. This is the another view in this direction, and here basically the control panel of the, our uh, photoelectron spectrometer. One can do the computer control uh, scanning of the photon beam, and one can generate the spectrum. This is the hemispherical analyzer of the experimental station, which can give the energy versus uh, binding energy versus a graph is shown in this figure, and other power supply and electron control. These are the basically the vacuum controllers. so this is the complete beam line and these are the spectrum one can generate this is the calibration spectrum to check the binding energy positions whether we are getting the correct binding energy or not one has to do the different uh, experiment or different samples trial sample these are the basically the first spectrum was generated with our old spectrometer it is basically the platinum you can see that the platinum core level 4f 5 by 2 4f 7 by 2 one can get uh, this way and here basically the and this is the spectrum which is generated within the 1 hour 2 minutes normally in laboratory you will require the 1 hour 2 hours for this kind of spectrum to generate because you have to do the scanning and scanning continuous scanning of the this energy range and then you will get because their energy uh, intensity source uh, source of intensity is very less here basically you are getting within 5 minutes you can generate the spectrum and this way uh, one can get the uh, Save the time and you can generate the very good quality spectrum. And these are the specification of the photoelectron workstation. Basically, we have the hemispherical analyzer. Then we, the resolution is around 0.8 eV resolution is possible. And then uh, this is the with new spectrometer. We have got the very good quality. Here you can see that as compared to the earlier spectrum, the noise is very less because of the complete alignment of the beam line. and you have the very intense source that's why and this spectrum is generated within the 2 minutes this single scan with single scan only in laboratory you will require the very multi scan the 30 scan 40 scan 50 scan depending upon the your sample nature also and what kind of studies one we people have already carried out basically one can do the photo emission study of passivated gallium arsenide surfaces then photo emission study of doping uh, of some of the oxide samples then valence band study of some copper ag dope of electron irradiated what uh, normally uh, people are doing irradiation in the polymers and other kind of thing that kind of problems also one can study then core level and normal core level valence band photo emission investigation uh, of the very uh, insulating samples also you can do because in laboratory insulating sample basically gives the noise and because of that noise you will not get a very good quality spectrum but in here intensity wise it is very large intensity so one can get the good quality spectrum signal to noise ratio is also very high here then uh, silicon nitride photoelectron spectroscopy laser irradiated samples photoelectron what kind of thing where your surface physics is concerned whether you are interested in surface properties then you can do go and do the photo emission spectrometer this is the one of the example i am giving you the valence band spectroscopy for example i have the two types of sample one is basically the thick film of 150 nanometer of fe3o4 and another is the nano structure of fe3o4 this is the our nano structure afm photograph you will see that very minute change is there in the valence band but that will change the physics of the fe3o4 material that is the basically beauty of this technique and the beauty of this beam line that you can have very small uh, amount of sample still you are getting the very good quality without noise any spectrum is generated so same material with different uh, shape one is thin film and one is nano particle so you will see that the near to the fermi energy level there will be the change in the density of states and because of that density of state the electronic structure is also one can do the theoretical calculation and find out the what is basically the changes in between once you are, you go from the 150 nanometer to the 2 nanometer so that kind of problems also one can do and then another uh, advantage of this uh, synchrotron based photo emission spectroscopy is basically you have having the tunable photon energy normally in laboratory you will see that you have the helium one source or helium two source they have the fixed photon energy 
or you have the aluminum k alpha source or mg mg k alpha source you have the 1200 or 400 ev photon energy but here basically the because synchrotron is giving the continuous energy range so here basically you can tune the photon energy depending upon the absorption state of your sample and because of the tuning the photon energy one can get the resonance in the your photo emission spectrum and because of the resonance one can get the uh, one get get the advantage and one can get the very good quality photo intensity get uh, resonantly enhanced and one can get the good quality spectrum and one can have the analysis of that type of problem so resonant photo emission spectroscopy is the very uh, important technique as per as the today uh, this doping and other kind of things are concerned whether you want to see the element specific kind of thing whether you want to see that whether one element is interacting with the other element whether hybridization is there or that kind of thing so that kind of problem one can study using this synchrotron based which is not possible at all at the laboratory though you are having the laboratory photo electron spectrometer you will not get uh, do the resonant photo emission spectroscopy in a laboratory so that is the advantage of synchrotron based photo emission spectroscopy so this is basically the uh, one of the example i am showing you for the resonant photo emission spectroscopy here basically i am changing the input photon energy so input photon energy from where i am changing i am changing it from the my monochromator from my monochromator i am changing the angle and now uh, that uh, changing the 40 ev 53 ev 54 ev 50 very small uh, changes are there but you will see that the near the fermi energy you will get the different peak is coming out also this peak is also varying as a function of uh, position is also varying so this kind of things one can get and one can do the fine analysis of this thing and very high quality uh, research can come out on this thing. so this is basically one of the example i have given on the fe3o4 film on the gallium arsenide substrate so this is basically the resonant photo emission spectroscopy kind of thing one can do using the synchrotron based then this is again one of the another example this is uh, if you a um, lot of people are going uh, doing the doping of sample in some oxides kind of thing but uh, you don't know about what uh, will happen once you dope the material inside this thing whether it is interacting with the host lattice or whether it is only uh, acting as a cluster or a isolated uh, kind of cluster or sitting inside the material or whether it is really interacting chemically interacting with the post lattice that kind of thing one can find out by using the resonant photo emission spectroscope so this is the one of the example here basically we are interested in to convert this molybdenum oxide which is useful as a very good sensor but we want to add it one additional property of magnetic sensor for magnetic sensor so that's why we decided to put the magnetic impurity inside this thing and whether that impurity is basically interacting with the host lattice that is molybdenum oxide or not that is find out by this uh, problem so this is one of the problem done by my student and that can be find out so this is lot of data one has to generate you can see that this is the one of the uh, valence band spectrum for at one energy 34 energy but here then i have used the different energies and different spectrums were generated these are basically the three different sample one is the pure molybdenum oxide one is the 0.2% doping and one is the 0.5% doping iron doping so this is the basically uh, one can generate this spectrum and then one can do the analysis uh, can you narrate lecture sir mere ko pata tha so this this type of problem also one can do and because basically here you can see that only 2% or 5% doping is there you will in normal laboratory level photo electron spectroscopy you will not get the signal from the iron itself so iron signal is not there then you will not get any information about the what is good doping is going but because the synchrotron uh, in radiation photo electron spectroscopy the intensity is very high so that's why uh, one can get the good quality spectrum and one can get the analysis a uh, good one can do the good quality analysis by using this good quality spectra and find out what is happening once you dope iron doping into the molybdenum oxide so this is one of the paper by our student and then he has done the analysis as a function of energy what is basically happening to the different peaks and then finally he find out that molyb uh, iron is basically and one a peak he found out around 46 ev where uh, photon energy where he has found that at the 46 ev uh, basically uh, because of the iron uh, level is there and that iron level is basically matching with this uh, 46 ev 
and that's why basically the iron is not only sitting as a isolated cluster inside the molybdenum oxide but it is acting and uh, interacting with the molybdenum and it is forming the compound with the molybdenum so that is the conclusion of this paper but that this kind of experiment one can do using this photo emission synchrotron based photo emission spectroscope then uh, this is one of the paper of lanthanum calcium manganese oxide basically what is basically the origin of electron phase separation you know that these manganites are very important nowadays and lot of people are basically working on these manganite people and then uh, but uh, if you want to use in for the societal application just like a sensors and other kind of thing then you have to put the material in thin film form but thin film form again there is a one uh, uh, problem is that which type of sur uh, substrate is basically used because of the substrate also one can change get the change in the properties of the same material if you use the different substrate then the same material of lanthanum calcium manganese will go show you the different property so that is basically so how one can check it so that is basically done by this paper in using the synchrotron based photoelectron spectroscopy this is the normal core level xk spectra done at the laboratory you will see that the, this one L lcmo is deposited simultaneously on the two substrates one is the lao substrate lanthanum aluminate and one is the strontium titanate substrate you will see that core level structure is exactly identical if you see that then one can conclude from this core level uh, spectroscopy of xbr that the, both the films are basically having the same property but if you go to the synchrotron based valence band spectroscopy you will see that the both the spectrums are not same the lcmo and the srtio3 and lcmo and lal3 is also different and what is the difference basically the density of states near the fermi energy level are different and you know that if the density of states are different in the near to the fermi level then it is interaction of this material with the other material if you use as a sensor then it will be the difference so that is the basically the fine details can be find out using the synchrotron application based photo emission spectroscopy so these are the basically some of the examples i will not go into details of all other kind of thing this is one of the uh, example from the pune university people have done basically for example if you go out with the nanoparticle samples because nanoparticle samples uh, with the in laboratory spectra you will not get the very good quality spectra there but if you go with the synchrotron radiation photo emission then you can get the very good quality here basically the nanoparticles of cadmium selenide iron substitution is there and uh, normally in laboratory you will not because of the nanoparticle size itself is very small so iron uh, the doping whatever substitution is there iron will not give the signal but here you can see that you have got the uh, information about the iron from this valence band spectroscopy using the synchrotron radiation and which is basically correlated with the magnetization measurement and one publication is there from the synchrotron radiation so this way very good quality or high quality research one can do using this synchrotron based photo emission spectroscope how many minutes are there no oh yes sir uh, any problem sir Like uh, sir, you can take uh, 20 minutes or uh, 20, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. No problem. Okay. okay. So I will uh, now. I have already shown the examples. Now I will go to the other beam line. What kind of measurement? So that people may be interested to do the other kind of work, not only photo emission spectroscopy. So what kind of other things are there that I will tell you? so these are basically the publications related to the uh, from our this beam line these are all available in our website and these papers are also available so you don't have to worry about the uh, journal subscription all these papers pdf copies are available whatever papers are coming from this uh, index one uh, beam lines basically are available so this is the link for these papers one can get the link and if anybody is interested in any paper they can download that paper from this link and you can and they can and then other beam lines already i tell you these are the other beam lines on this thing one is the soft x ray reflectivity beam line on the index one here basically one can get the reflectivity and one can get the uh, thickness of the thin beam so 
interface characterization also there suppose you have the two bilayer two trilayer or two multilayer then interface characterization can be done using this x-ray reflectivity beam line this is the another beam line on this indus one then high resolution vacuum ultraviolet beam line the energy range is 4 to 12 ev the resolution is 0.1 angstrom then you have atoms and molecules spectroscopy kind of thing one can use uh, this beam line this is by the drc people so here one can do the uh, absorption experiment uh, then photophysics beam line here wavelength is different it is 50 nanometer to 350 nanometer. One can do the photo absorption spectroscopy. The, here we can do the solids as well as liquids as well as gases also. So that kind of spectroscopy, matrix isolation spectroscopy kind of thing work work can do using this uh, beam line. This is the another beam line by BRC. Then angle resolve photo electron. Whatever I have told you about the photo electron spectroscopy, that was the angle integrated. But if you want to uh, know about the uh, cave hector of the any uh, material inside the sample, the surface characterization, there one can use the angle resolve photo emission spectroscopy. So that is also available on this Indus one uh, synchrotron radiation source. And now I will tell you about the what kind of beam lines are there in Indus two. So Indus two is the bigger ring. Here basically the electromagnetic radiation is up to the hard X-ray, so one can uh, get the different beam lines for the different application. One is the dispersive exam, then energy dispersive X-ray diffraction, angle dispersive X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence, microprobe. So that is basically very important beam line. Then lithography, for example, to generate the samples in nano size or other kind of things. The lithography is very important technique. So that lithography, one can prepare the sample also using the in the synchrotron beam. So that is also one of the uh, these things. And then X-ray photoelectron photo already told you protein crystallography for the biology or biochemistry uh, people. Then scanning exhausts. Exhausts is, you know that in, normally suppose materials are present in the two uh, part, basically crystalline materials and the amorphous material. For crystalline materials, we normally use the X-ray diffraction technique. But for the amorphous material, you don't know how to characterize that kind of thing. So that is basically the exhaust X-ray absorption fine structure. Here, basically, one can get the near neighbor information, and from this near neighbor information, one can find out the what kind of structure is there inside the sample. So that is basically for the amorphous sample, one can do the exhaust kind of thing. So that is also possible at this thing. And this is red color. Basically, I have told you about that the properties of this synchrotron radiation that is polarized light beam line. So how one can use the polarized light beam line? So all of these beam lines you have seen that there is a basically the structural characterization, there is a chemical characterization, there is basically the sample preparation, or there is a basically a one can have the bonding and atomic molecular kind of spectroscopy kind of thing. But here basically you see that nothing is there for the magnetic magnetism people. How one can just get, get the magnetic property measurement using the synchrotron radiation? So that was our basically the aim to do the magnetic measurement using the synchrotron radiation. And for that purpose, we have decided to go for the polarized light beam line for the soft X-ray absorption. So I will tell you about only this. This is the basically the novelty of our work. And this is the new technique. What is basically used using the synchrotron radiation, how one can use the magnetic properties of this uh, material. So that will I will tell you. And these are uh, just for the completeness XRD beam line. These are here extra extra diffraction. One can do the extra diffraction between high kV to 20 kV. Normally in our laboratory we are using the copper K alpha that is 8 kV. But here we can have the uh, energy variation as well as you have the pressure variation as you have the temperature variation. So temperature dependent extra diffraction a pressure dependent x-ray diffraction that kind of thing one can do with this x-ray beam line then the exhaust already i told you for the amorphous then you have the energy range from 5 kv to 20 kv temperature range is from 5 k to room temperature so this is also available then scanning exhaust this xrf microprobe xrf microprobe is basically the composition uh, to knowing the composition of unknown composition into the sample and what is the percentage of that comp composition. Normally, people use the ACM and EDAX in the laboratory, but the EDAX has the limitation and uh, you can have the PPM level only the resolution. However, one can go higher with the, the synchrotron radiation beam. One can have the X-ray fluorescence and that uh, beam line is also available and with the X-ray fluorescence to have the composition details. So this is basically the trace element analysis of the one hair uh, sample. Human hair was basically cross section was done and uh, find out what elements are present into this thing. This is the X-ray fluorescence application. 
lot of people are may be interested in this thing then uh, just like our angle dependent x ray diffraction there is a energy dispersed x ray diffraction in energy dispersed because you know that in, in uh, our synchrotron basically the continuous energy source is there so one can have the one shot x ray diffraction system and because of the one shot one can have the uh, uh, any any kind of dynamic experiment can be done using the x ray diffraction at this x ray in angle dispersed uh, diffraction you have to scan the thing so for scanning you will require the uh, minimum time So, but here basically one shot experiment is there. So one shot you get the X-ray diffraction. So one can have the dynamic uh, experiment. You can you increase the pressure, you can increase the temperature, or you can do, do any uh, kind of chemical reaction inside the material. You will get the immediate X-ray diffraction result of that. So that is basically the energy dispersive X-ray diffraction is also there available. then protein crystallography basically just like a crystallography this is for the biology people that crystallography of a new new, uh, new proteins can be uh, generated and then that proteins can be the structure can be find out using this protein crystallography right this is the one of the application and then this is i already told you that x ray lithography one can uh, have the generate the uh, devices using this uh, lithography kind of technique at the synchrotron radiation beam line and then i will tell you about this this, uh, this is the polarization property we have used to develop the technique for the magnetic measurement so how we have used the this technique this basically the polarize you know that above and below if you tap the beam then one can get the polarized light in the synchrotron radiation so i will tell you so if you have the two types of polarized beam one can do the absorption experiment using the both the polarization that is left circular polarization and right circular polarization so same sample one can use for the two types of absorption experiment one using the first, uh, left circular and one is right circular there you will get the absorption difference and that absorption difference is basically give you the xmcd kind of x-ray magnetic circular dichroism kind of spectrum and this x-ray magnetic circular dichroism is basically useful to study the magnetic properties of the matter it is the basically the signature of the magnetic material so how one can do that thing so basically the same beam line is, uh, we have done we have the basically the source then we have the aperture only thing is that now aperture we have to tap the beam above or below not at the exactly at the center so instead uh, instead of focusing the beam on the uh, pre mirror direct beam of the from the center we are moving the aperture so for first uh, left circular polarized we are moving this first aperture to the above resting and for right circular we are going to the down circle other uh, components are same basically grating is there post mirror is there pre mirror is there slits are there uh, but only thing is that we are putting one additional aperture here that aperture will select the position of the beam and that will de decide the how much polarized light is coming inside the synchrotron beam line so that way you can uh, do the left circular polarized light and right circular polarized the the main condition is that the beam intensity should be the same and uh, both the beam direction for the left circular and the right circular so this is basically confirmed by the our uh, theoretical calculation that whenever we move the aperture we will get the same kind of beam it is basically the mirror image of the first beam so left circular mirror uh, beam is this and right circular beam is this way so this is basically exactly identical and then we have developed this uh, mechanical design develop and uh, we have prepared the beam line there so these are the specification of that beam line energy range is from 100 eV to 1200 eV and then this is the you can see that the synchrotron beam at the entrance slit so this slit we are moving so that we have, can have the polarized beam this is the normal beam from the center so here basically the normal absorption spectrum to check the whether energy range is correct or not for that example we have recorded the graphite spectrum in 2013 this is the final beam on the sample you can see that at the exit slit this is the beam and this is the on the sample so very fine beam is there very small sample is necessary for to do the measurement and then these are the some preliminary results of normal absorption experiment when you select the beam from the center you can get the normal absorption experiment and then a uh, lot of people are used for the normal absorption study but i will show you what is about the mag new things that is magnetic nature so this is the new addition which we have put where we say we have put the basically for to do the magnetic measurement one will require the permanent magnetic source for the sample 
have the magnetization inside the sample. So to, to magnetize the sample, electromagnet is put inside this thing, and that electromagnetic switch is also there. Basically, instead instead of doing the left circular right or right circular right, one can change the direction of the field of the direction. Also, one can change. So here, basically, we are changing the electro. We are keeping the beam fixed at the one position of left circular, and we are changing the magnetic direction. of the field direction so this way basically two tesla magnet is put inside the chamber and then we have collected this xmcd spectrum this is the first xmcd spectrum of our country in our country no, nobody uh, has done such kind of experiment and this is the first experiment carried out using the synchrotron radiation so this is the first magnetic measurement using the indus synchrotron source so it was done in 2018 very recently and then uh, i already told you this sample in when i told you about the uh, photo emission beam line this is the nanometer ap304 and this nanometer ap304 and this is the 150 mm uh, that is thick ap304 so what is the difference here we have seen only the electronic structure difference that slightly density of states are different in this sample but what is basically the mag because this ap304 is very important magnetic material basically used in the recording media and other kind of thing so what is the Difference between the two nanometer magnetic properties of two nanometer and one fifty nanometer. So basically, here basically we have done the XMCD measurement of both the sample, and finally we have concluded that you know that if the magnetic properties are basically there are two types of um, moment. One is the orbital moment, and one is the spin moment. So magnetic uh, moment is basically consists of L plus S, the orbital moment and the spin moment so this is basically we have checked the both the samples one is basically 2 nanometer ap304 xmcd measurement and one other is the 150 nanometer xmcd measurement and we have done the calculation from the whatever uh, experimental data of the absent and finally we have found that 150 nanometer ap304 basically has the zero orbital moment in normally in uh, three dimensional structure the orbital moment is quinch and this 2 nanometer ap304 you can see that basically the 1.4 uh, orbital moment is there so basically the material is same ap304 but in nanometer form the magnetic moment is higher in the ap304 and if the magnetic material is basically, normally one can expect that 150 nanometer the thicker film should show the ma higher magnetic moment but if you see that the 2 nanometer size sample basically giving the higher magnetic moment so these are the conclusion and this is the first paper from this xmcd this, from our country this type of measurement facility is not available anywhere in our country this is the first facility which we have our institute has developed and uh, we have published the paper and now uh, after that lot of people have came for this xmcd kind of measurement uh, for the magnetic material and lot of people have uh, basically uh, got the very good kind of data and as well as very good publications are already there now from last two years of this xmcd kind of beam so uh, next in our uh, next uh, planning we are going to because you know that the magnetic properties are basically the temperature dependent so we require to put the temperature dependent attachment at the xmcd otherwise uh, so one can study the phase transition from ferromagnet to uh, paramagnetic or ferromagnetic to anti ferromagnetic kind of thing so that kind of uh, things one can study using this low temperature attachment so that is our future plan so we are going to do this thing and another beam line if you see that all the beam lines available at the indus 1 and indus 2 this energy range is basically missing from the most of the beam line so we are planning to de develop the new soft x ray beam line in this energy range basically this energy range is very important as far as the recent uh, this sensors and other kind of things are important uh, so this is the our uh, just we are got the low temperature attachment this is the electromagnet and this is the cryostat so we have already tested the cryostat and very soon we will install it on the beam line and then uh, this new beam line uh, basically uh, is under development that is bl26 which will be cover the energy range from 1500 the fourth thousand so in conclusion i will conclude my talk at indus complex there is a huge possibility for condensed matter physics to characterize materials bulk as well as thin film nanostructures for their structural magnetic and electronic property as well as to do the chemical analysis
So I acknowledge all the peer technical and supporting staff from our institute, then Dr. R.J. Choudhury and Mukul Gupta, my colleague, who are working with me, then our director, Professor Paul, uh, and the users of Beamline on Indus 1 and Indus 2, from which uh, I have taken the results to show you, and then uh, Indus operating staff. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful and enthusiastic talk. So we are uh, we are very much lucky to watch your talk on the topic of indus synchrotron radiation sources and its application. We are known that these facilities are very unique, and only two and three places such kind of facilities are available in our India. Maybe. So uh, we and our audience are also very much thankful to you for such a energetic session and energetic talk, sir. Thank you once again. So now it's time open for question and answer session. Yes. So those, those who are interested to ask, if you have any query or any doubt regarding the regarding the current session, so they can ask. Hello, is it audible? Yes, yes, yes. please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, really uh, nice lecture. Uh, hello, Pastor, sir. Uh, hello, Shankar. Uh, sir, Shankar, Shankar, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, can we uh, directly differentiate the DFT and XS and the VBS data? Direct or need any other technique? No, no, no. Directly you can do that. Only. Uh, uh, XS and uh, what uh, balance band spectra. Yeah, yeah. Give the same data as uh, uh, as we get in the day of the. The XS data will be the different beamline, and the balance band data will be the uh, soft X ray, no? Yes, yes. Yeah, but you can, can we compare the... with the day of the data, carotid yes, data? Yes, yes, yes. You can compare that. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir. Uh, this Indus Beamline facility is available for everyone. So yes, yes, the yes, college yes. level staff also. Yeah, or yeah, college, college, level. college researchers also they are uh, this thing. But only thing is that your sample quality and sample should be good. Otherwise, you can come to the, our institute. You can prepare the sample. You can just come with the idea, or you can just come with the proposal, and then uh, try to uh, deposit because we have very good thin thin facilities. We can good uh, uh, prepare the sample as per your requirement. And then uh, you can go to the because the synchrotron facility, the, the time is very important. You cannot uh, test the various samples of there. The, the quality of the sample should be there. Also, the lifetime of the sample is also there. So you cannot put the sample uh, and um, after one year you can bring the sample. That way one is not possible. So it will be better that you can write a proposal. You can go to our website. There are the proposal opening is also there. There are, there are two types of proposal. One is basically short-term proposal, one is long-term proposal. So long-term proposal is not necessary, college people can do because they have their own work, lot of things are there. But one-time one time proposal one can write and one can come and see the facilities. And then uh, they will have the idea how one can uh, work out uh, this thing. And then uh, maybe in the holidays uh, or the long holidays and other kind of things then can come. And, and nowadays also they, it is very... Uh, but still, we are not open to the users. We are also taking the sample through post only okay. because this industry is not open for the external users. Maybe within uh, after Diwali, I think it will be open. But samples we are taking from the post by post. Okay. So, answer uh, one more doubt. So, it is possible. Uh, it means that the college faculty can apply for uh, minor or major fund to yes, the yes. DAE. Yeah, you can see it, uh, see our website. I think presently call is open for the long term project. Only the college, uh, condition is that your college should have some uh, some research uh, activities. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. Not, not necessary equipment, but at least some people are interested or maybe you are the registered guide of some inner city or kind of thing. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. No, so some uh, audience have some doubts, so they may ask directly. Yes. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. So one of uh, uh, participant, A. Pradeep, asked the question from Telangana. What is the major difference between Indus 1 and Indus 2? 
major difference between indus 1 and indus 2 i told that the synchrotron radiation is basically the electromagnetic radiation so the energy range is different so whatever photons are coming out from the indus 1 and indus 2 they are basically the energy range in indus 2 you are getting the hard x rays also but in indus indus 1 basically you are acceleration is up to 450 mev and in indus 2 acceleration is up to 2.5 gv so that's why here we are getting the very uh, hard x-rays up to the 100 kV photon beam is available. But in Indus 1, the, the energy range is very limited up to 1.5 or 2 kV. Uh, sir, one of the participants, uh, Prakash Shetty, is asking the question, what's happening when increasing bending magnets in Indus? We are not increasing the bending magnet. That will depend upon the radius of the curvature, in which curvature we want to travel the electron. So, if the curvature is bigger, then electron uh, uh, magnet, number of magnet will be higher, will be required no, to bend the thing. You have to keep the circular path. The radius is bigger, then number of magnet will be higher, will be required. No? Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, that's why Indus 1 and Indus 2 uh, radius are different. Because in Indus 1, energy is only 450 MeV. And here, it's basically reaching 2.5 GeV, giga electron uh, Okay, so thank you. So one more question from our UG students. She's asking the question, sir, how to generate Fermi level, uh, Fermi level layer in Indus? I... You cannot generate the Fermi level. Any, every material has the Fermi level. You have to measure the Fermi level of the using the Indus synchrotron or photoelectron spectroscopy. Photoelectron spectroscopy basically gives you the electronic structure. So where you will get the zero uh, electron energy, that is basically the Fermi level. And for that, you have to do the calibration. So you have to put the gold material because gold material is very pure. So along with your sample, you can put the gold material and gold material where the zero electron binding energy is there, that is your Fermi level. And that Fermi level is basically one can find out using the your Fermi level is always there elect, because every material has an electronic structure. You have to identify the Fermi level once uh, and the Fermi level is that level where basically the zero electron volt is matching at that level. Hello, uh, sir. One of the participants, Sakshi Thakur, she asked from Madhya Pradesh. She asked them, what is the role of entrance slit in beam line arrangement? Entrance lead is basically you know that the resolution is most of the important part of the spectroscopy. So if you want to have the very good resolution, then you should have some control over the inside beam, which is entering into the your monochromator. So that's why the entrance lead and exit slits are there. So first entrance lead will decide the oh, how much beam we are going to put. So because you know that the beam exactly at the center, the beam is very intense and once you go away from the center, the beam is diffuse. So that diffuse part will basically use the noise in your spectrum. So you have to avoid that diffuse part. So that's why slit is necessary there. So you can X and Y direction, you can cut the thing and you can exactly get the center of the beam. So that is basically the need of the... Hello. One another question. Amol Singh Rathod from uh, Rajasthan. He asked what happening when increasing bending magnet in Indus 1 or Indus 2. Bending magnet will give you the number of bending magnet more than more bending uh, your beam line will be there. So more applications will be there. So at a time, suppose there are four bending magnet, then at least four beam lines will be available. If there are eight beam line, uh, then depending upon that thing, uh, you can have the number of beam lines. Because each bending magnet will have the two beam lines. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable guidance and valuable speech. Uh, there is no doubt that our audience may enjoy very more and they get very large amount of knowledge from your talk as well as Boris Kursar's lecture. So we are now we are in last mode. So it's time for feedback. If there is any feedback from the audience, they can unmute yourself directly. One by one. Yes, sir. Dr. Shahzad. Hello, sir. Sir, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please. 
good afternoon to one and all sir myself dr shehzad from maharashtra college of arts science and commerce mumbai so this is great pleasure for me giving feedback on buraska sir's lecture buraska sir we have learned many things and most importantly basics behind uh, any systems and any topics from your lecture sir you have given very informative lecture starting from basics of nuclear physics types of accelerators types of particles working principle circular accelerator cyclotron magnetron neutron generator and information and uh, information of accelerators in universities and in our countries sir you also explained many many different applications related to radiations sir we have learned in one hour many things we have learned many things from your lecture from your expertise and enjoyed your lecture so thank you sir for sharing your knowledge to all of us i also thanks to the department of physics data dada patil mahavidyalay for organizing such a wonderful lectures for for such a wonderful session thank you sir uh thank you so much dr shehzad sir for your valuable feedback welcome sir welcome. about our webinar so if there is any feedback from the audience they can unmute directly yes mr kishor ha uh, yes good afternoon all of you i am kishor gawane from the department of physics savitribai phule pune university uh, i would like to thanks the all organizing committee of the online webinar nuclear radiation and its societal applications it's, it is very nice webinar which is uh, organized during that pandemic situation uh, two main uh, lectures delivered by the emit emitter scientist first lecture delivered by professor vn boroskar sir which is very useful uh, they talked about the low energy particle accelerator and its uh, applications also they have focused on the food food irradiation dosimetry as well as the application of the various uh, process of food irradiations which will be very beneficial for all uh, graduate post graduate and the research students uh, second lecture delivered by the professor dm phase sir which we, which is also useful for all the students uh, to uh, know about how to operate the indus uh, synchrotron radiation and uh, how to use uh, use it in a future uh, for all researchers also i would like i would like to thanks uh, special dr mahesh badane and all the organizing committee of the data patil mahavidyalay karzat to organizing such a wonderful webinar during that pandemic situation once again thank you so much all of all of the organizing committee thank you so much uh, thank you mr kishor for your valuable feedback hello Now, mahesh badane sir Yes, yes. Please. I also wanted to give feedback on DM Fasse, sir. Yes, please, please, please. Sir, you have given very informative lecture on uh, this uh, synchrotron radiation, and uh, one thing that uh, I have gained from your lecture that it is open to all college teachers and university teacher. That is beneficial to us also and our students also. So thank you, sir, for giving such a nice information to us. so i am sure to you sir that uh, we will surely part, uh, come to your laboratory and see what are the techniques available in your institute so thank you sir for your lecture uh, thank you mr shehza sir uh, i know that uh, whatever the information given by uh, dr fase sir that is very huge and very informative for all the college staff so this may i now request mr sopan thorat to propose a top thanks about the webinar uh, first of all good afternoon all of you i am sapan m forat assistant professor department of physics dada patil mahavidyalay karzat uh, it is my great pleasure to give a vote of thanks on the behalf of organizing committee department of physics dada patil mahavidyalay karzat uh, first of all i would like to thank our honorable principal dr bar kamle sir for allowing Uh, uh, to arrange such nice uh, nice program i would also like to thanks uh, our today's eminent speaker dr v n boraskar sir for giving uh, valuable information about different types of accelerators and their use 
uh, and the use of nuclear radiations uh, in different techniques as well as their use in medicinal as well as in agriculture. I also like to thank Dr. Uh, D.M. Fasse sir for guiding to our student about Indus synchrotron, uh, synchrotron radiation sources and their applications in daily life. Uh, I would like to thank uh, to our HOD, uh, Dr. M. A. Patil sir, uh, Dr. A. G. Thube sir, and the coordinator of the today's program, Mr. Mahanaur sir. I also like to thank Dr. Uh, M. S. Badani sir, uh, who is a co-coordinator of our today's program. I also like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, VK Pandit sir, Mr. A. R. Pardeshi sir, for their cooperation uh, to become this uh, program successful. Lastly, I would like to uh, thank uh, OS of the college, Mr. Dado sir, as well as the non-teaching staff uh, of the department for their cooperation as well as support. So with the permission of uh, authority, I declare that uh, the today's webinar is over. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again, all of you. Uh, thank you, respected Fasi sir, for joining us and your, giving us your valuable time for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So there is small announcement regarding the feedback link. So the feedback link will be shared on the WhatsApp group shortly. So you can fill the feedback link and get the certificate. So you must see the feedback link on WhatsApp group. You, you have to fill that feedback link very carefully, your name, your appellation, and submit that feedback link. So you will get the certificate quickly. So you can see the feedback link on WhatsApp group. Thank you, everyone.